Hello, yeah. So, welcome and very good morning to all of you. Uh, We're going to start uh, today's session today, uh, now. And uh, we have a couple of presentations followed by a valedictory session. And uh, to start with, I'll request Professor Jitendra Bera to come up on stage and share this session for us. Uh, professor Bera is an eminent professor of chemistry from IIT Kanpur, and I hand over the mic to you to start the session. Thank you so much. I've been instructed to wait for a minute, so I'll, I'll wait. So this is about Press a video. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we welcome to the first session of the final day of uh, the 30th CRSI NSC meeting. And uh, we have a very special lecture on Imesh Chakubarti and Naumel lecture. And to deliver that, we have a very distinguished colleague with us, Professor Holger Bronswick. Uh, Professor Bronswick is currently the chair and head of inorganic chemistry and founding director of the Institute for Sustainable Chemistry and Catalysis with Boron at University of Ujbuk. Uh, Professor, Uj, uh, Professor Brunswick is a prolific researcher, published more than 600 uh, publications. His work has been highlighted in Times of London, Scientific American, New Scientist, Nature, Science, and many other, uh, many other journals. Professor Brunswick has received many major national and international awards, and to name a few, Royal Society of Chemistry Main Group and Mont Nilam Awards, the Frederick Hawthorne Award of the American Chemical Society, the German Chemical Society Alfred Stock National Memorial Award, 
and Leibniz Prize of the DFG. With a small introduction, uh, please join me welcoming Professor Brasso. Yeah, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Thank you very much for your <laughs> hospitality, for inviting me here. And uh, thank you very much for all the good times that we already spent together. Um, I very much enjoyed last dinner and everything that came with it. Thank you very much. I very much enjoy being here. Um, and I would like to share some of our chemistry with you. And that chemistry has to do with main group elements um, and particularly with, with boron. And the question I, I would like to address is whether a light main group element such as boron can actually behave if it, if, as if it was a transition metal. So that is, okay, thank you. That is today's question. Um, I try to address that. So how come that um, transition metals can actually activate small molecules? Well, our understanding and textbook knowledge is that um, they are electronically very, very flexible. Um, they do have non-bonding electron pairs and vacant orbitals in spatial and energetic proximity. This is what makes a transition metal a transition metal. Um, and when we look at a very simple Duet Duncanson model, we see how that can interact with H2 and eventually activate H2 by means of sigma donation and pi back donation. It was believed until probably 20 years ago that only transition metals can facilitate um, the activation of small molecules because main group elements won't have that um, electronic flexibility. So if we look at three archetypal um, main group element species, borane, methane, and ammonia, we will find a non-bonding vacant molecular orbital, yes, in case of the, of the trigonal planar BH3. We find a non-bonding lone, uh, non-bonding lone pair of electrons in, in the case of ammonia, and we find none of both um, in case of methane, of course. So we may have one or the other, but mostly we have neither of those electronic properties. Um, however, about 20 years ago, work by Power and later Guy Bertrand told us, well, this is not, this is not right. Actually, also certain main group element species are capable of activating small molecules such, such as H2 or ammonia or CO or others by very similar um, electron donation, electron acceptor properties. So what makes these and other main group elements different from methane and from, from borane and ammonia? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, they are all hypovalent species. So that means we have the main group element in a lower oxidation state. Um, looking at boron, um, which is certainly sort of our, our favorite playground, there is a number of boron-containing species in which the boron, in a very formal sense, would have a lower oxidation state than the stable plus three state. And that would be, for example, diborine, so species with a BB triple bond, and diborene species with a BB double bond. We have contributed a lot to their chemistry, um, and this is not actually today's topic, and it suffices to say that also these species can activate H2 and other small molecules. Um, and here's an example, one of our diborines, um, an unsaturated BB species interacts, adds water, uh, um, dihydrogen under ambient conditions, um, and this is um, the proposed mechanism which is very similar to the activation of H2 by the digermine of Phil Power. But as I said, this is not um, today's topic. But today I would like to talk about borylene. Now, what is a borylene? The parent species is a four electron species. It has only um, one pair of um, electrons in the non-bonding fashion and one pair of electrons in a bonding fashion. It has two vacant orbitals, only four valence electrons, and certainly a very, very reactive molecule. And of course, thermodynamically, very unstable, as all of these hypovalent species 
of the light main group elements. Um, looking at group three in particular, and I took the numbers for the boron chloride or the element chloride um, from um, Hans-Georg Schnöckel's work, you see that BCL, the monochloroborane, the chloroboroline, if you like, will undergo a very exothermic disproportionation into boron and BCL3. For aluminium, the situation is similar, and only when we go down group 13, finally arriving at thallium, things will be reversed, and thallium-1, as we all know, is more stable than thallium-3. Now, if you want to deal with these compounds, um, you have to um, put them at um, very high temperature in the dilute gas phase, or you can generate them in, in very cold matrices, but not um, under ambient conditions. When we started our work a while ago, 30 years ago, we thought, well, we don't want to do um, um, work in matrices. We don't want to do work in, in um, dilute gas phase at 2,000 degrees C. What do we do? Well, we, we um, actually go and stabilize the boroline in the coordination sphere of a transition metal, as it was done with so many highly reactive um, molecules and ligands. And that works very well, and we've been doing that for many, many years. And you can see that the, the boroline behaves pretty much like a CO, with which it, it is actually isoelectronic, um, and it forms terminal and semi-bridging and bridging um, and triply bridging species. Um, and it's also possible to make bisborolines, metalloborolines, oxoborolines, and whatnot. Um, and um, that was fashionable for a time. But um, after a while, it became more fashionable to stabilize a highly reactive species, not with a transition metal, but with a carbene. And so we tried the same. We wanted to make um, NHC-stabilized boroline, so we've been using N-heterocyclic carbenes. Um, and that was not the best choice. Um, only from the products, we could propose highly reactive NHC borolines as intermediates, but we couldn't properly stabilize them. In the same year, in 2011, Guy Bertrand actually showed us we should have better used his cyclic amino alkyl carbenes, the so-called KECs. They are useful and much better for the stabilization of borolines. Well, um, actually, we didn't give up on the boroline business. Um, and a while later, we found this very remarkable reaction here. This is one of our metal-stabilized borolines, but it's a very big beast, a terphenyl boroline. And that was under these conditions released from the chromium scaffold and forms this bis-carbonyl boroline complex. Now, looking at that species here, you could argue, well, this is boron, coordination number three. It's obviously trigonal planar, and there's three carbons around it. What is so special? This is just a triorganyl borane. No, it is not. Um, this is definitely a, a boron, um, a, a low-valent boron species. So we have a boroline, boron in the oxidation state plus one, which donates electron density back into the CO, like it were a transition metal. And um, the CO stretch gives it away immediately because we find CO stretching frequencies at about 2,000 centimeters to the minus one. This is exactly where you would find any odd um, terminal transition metal carbonyl complex. Um, and that indicates um, the um, back donation, the pi back donation from electron density at the boron into the two pi star orbital of the CO. And that makes this boroline complex boroline carbonyl complex fundamentally different from the borane carbonyl complexes which have been known for decades in which the CO is only a sigma donor and in which actually the borane is devoid of electron density um, and um, bipolarization actually stabilizes um, even the CO triple bond but the boroline weakens the CO triple bond because it donates electron density back into the two pi star of the CO. Well, this is the bonding situation. This is the homo of the molecule, and you can see we have a pi orbital, and the pi orbital is actually involved um, with the two pi star at the, C at the CO ligand. We have the nodal planes there. Um, that nicely shows the bonding situation. We started to call um, this metallomimetic chemistry not only because of um, the similarity in the bonding, but also because of the similarity in the reactivity. Now, what are the, the most important or the well-known, best-known um, 
reactions of transition metal carbonyl complexes. One is probably the, uh, the replacement of the CO. Um, the ligand exchange, and we can do exactly the same. We take one of our borylene carbonyl complexes, irradiate it, generate a very short-lived borylene, and that borylene then um, takes up pretty much any ligand that we throw at it, um, and uh, the new complexes are isolated in very good yields. So this is one reaction. The other one, which is very well known, I believe, or I should say is the, the Fischer carbene synthesis. And you all know how a Fischer carbene complex is actually synthesized. And here we have our borylene carbonyl complex, and we run through exactly the same reaction sequence. Phenolithium attacks at the CO carbon atom. We use a, a methyl plus source, and we make the Fischer carbene at the borylene exactly in the same way as you would make a Fischer carbene complex at chromium or tungsten. Now, um, after that, we got a bit reckless and thought, well, probably it's also possible to bind not only CO, but um, another very reluctant molecule, and that would be um, dinitrogen. You all know about the relevance of dinitrogen. The Haber-Bosch process has been mentioned many times in this conference as well. It is probably the most important technical pro process. It provides 250 million tons of ammonia every year, but it is very um, energy consuming because, and, 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 and thus um, it consumes about 2% of the world's energy production. And you all know why this is, uh, what this is good for fertilizers. And there's many studies which show that um, only half of the population of the world could be fed without, without um, fertilizers, um, artificial fertilizers, based on the Haber-Bosch process. And we also know that nature is much better than we are because in an enzymatic way of, um, by nitrogenase, you can activate um, dinitrogen under ambient condition and convert it into ammonia <clears throat> without need of these very, very harsh conditions. Now, um, the activation of N2 is a domain of transition metals, but a few years ago we could show that borolines also can do that. So um, we generated our very unstable um, short-lived borylene, not by um, this time by CO release, but by reduction, stepwise reduction. Um, and this compound, as I said, is very reactive. If we leave it under an atmosphere of argon, it just will undergo an intramolecular CH activation. However, if we put it um, with an excess of the reducing reagent under a blanket of dinitrogen, we find a reaction with the dinitrogen and um, this compound, this compound here. That was only the, uh, the beginning, and this is the complete um, reaction sequence that we could unveil. Um, so the most important thing for us was, can we do something with the nitrogen that we have act <coughs> activated? And of course, um, the question was, can we um, actually transform it into ammonia? And that was possible um, via that route here. So this is not a mechanism, it's not a proposed mechanism. It is um, a stoichiometric reaction and every single compound was isolated and fully characterized in solution and also um, in, um, with, with crystal, um, X-ray crystal analysis, excuse me. <coughs> the, the, the blue boxes denote the compounds where the NN bond is still intact and the green ones um, where the NN bond is cleaved, and at the very end, after um, a subsequent um, two-electron reduction, two-proton addition, reduction, proton addition, and so on and so forth, we arrive here, um, and you can see that we have formed the ammonia, if you like, in the coordination sphere of our CAC boroline, and after an acid quench, we release um, the ammonia as NH4, NH4+. Um, as I said, and you can do that in one, one pot um, and by using um, potassium graphite as the electron source and boric acid as the proton source, all in one pot, um, no need to isolate the intermediates. But this, as I said, is not a catalytic process, far from it. That will never replace the, the Haber-Bosch process because this is a stoichiometric reaction. And in order to make it more useful, we would have to make it reversible, which we have not yet achieved. 
Um, what can we do with these, with these compounds? I mean, chemistry is also pretty interesting here. Um, a, few, a few examples. So we have this very first compound that I showed you, which is the reduced um, bisborylene N2 species. And that dianionic species can be reversibly oxidized. And you can use air. The air should be dry. But otherwise, air is sufficient um, to oxidize this one into the neutral N N2 species, which can be reduced with potassium graphite back again into that dianion. The dianion can also be protonated, giving this bisboral hydrazine derivative, which turns out to be a diradical a di species. Um, we thought that these compounds were pretty useful for the um, functionalization of the N2 unit with um, organic substituents. Um, that seems to be impossible um, because these compounds here, um, they do show only, uh, or they do act only as very strong reducing reagents. They don't show any nucleophilicity at all. Um, and here's one of the very few reactions that actually work with that. Um, that's the reaction with copper one um, chloride. And you can see that two equivalents of the copper one are used for oxidizing the dianion to the neutral species, which you have seen before. And the second two equivalents of the copper halide then add to the two nitrogen atoms with formation of these bis-copper compounds. Um, now here's a more, if you like, organic reaction. And I mean, um, a PhD student must be very desperate to treat this compound with acetic acid anhydride. Um, and you can imagine was, what was before that on the list of all the compounds and, and reagents which didn't work. Um, and we found here this formation um, of a new heterocycle, um, <coughs> the, the N2B um, unit is still intact. Here's the acetic acid anhydride residue, if you like. Um, the two Kex and one boron were lost. Um, and while this is um, an interesting nitrogen boron oxygen containing heterocycle, please keep in mind that this actually comes from atmospheric nitrogen. So this is not from hydrazine or ammonia. This is actually coming from atmospheric nitrogen. The same here. This compound was formed from the neutral species with um, elemental sulfur. Um, and now the, the entire B2N2 unit was kept intact and is now bridged by a sulfur atom. So what you can see here is, if you like, um, inorganic thiophene. So BN, BN thiophene. And it is also mildly um, um, aromatic, as, as calculations showed. Now, what else can be done with the system? How does the nitrogen activation proceed? Well, this is not yet um, experimentally fully um, 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 shown, but it was, uh, it, this is all based on, on um, quantum chemical calculations carried out mostly by Bernd Engels and Max Holthausen. Um, and we propose that, um, first of all, a terminal N2 borylene complex is being formed. And that can be trapped with another boreline to give the B2N2 species. Or in case of, of, of the, the, the red reaction conditions, in particular when we use larger, group, larger R groups, um, we can have um, reduction first with formation of a radical species, an, an N-terminal radical species, which then undergoes um, um, a homocoupling reaction with formation of a very unusual B2N4 species. So that was the first example for the catenation of atmospheric um, dinitrogen. Um, we could prove that actually this compound is formed. Um, and upon further reduction, this compound can be trapped. It can be trapped with TMS chloride before the second boreline attacks. Um, and um, the, the, the product was fully characterized, but you see actually that the dip group from um, the keg from the carbene was migrating from one nitrogen to the other nitrogen, to the alpha nitrogen here. Um, and it was a, uh, we were able actually to, um, tr to trap or to isolate um, this, this compound before the dip was migrating. It, it was even possible um, to get that beast here on, on the diffractometer and to prove 
that this is the first step of the reaction, and then subsequently the dip group moves from one nitrogen to the other. Um, so what else can be done with these compounds? What else can be done with borrelines? If I say they behave as if they were transition metals, they can, of course, also activate other substrates, um, like amines or ammonia. Um, and again, um, we, we generated our short-lived borrelin um, from our radical precursor upon reduction. Um, the borrelin is not shown. It is immediately trapped with the, with the amine with um, um, oxidative addition of the NH bond across the boron carbon, the boron carbon bond. That can be done um, with electron-rich and electron-poor um, amines. It can also be done with, with ammonia. Um, one example for um, the oxidative addition of a substrate. Another example is um, the reaction with, um, with an olefin, with an unsaturated substrate. So does that also work? We actually started to put the, um, the olefin into the periphery of the keg. We've been using a cyclic amino alkyl carbene in which the alkyl group is actually a fused cyclohexene. Um, just to get that thing near to the reactive borrelin. Um, and then we made, um, by one electron reduction, we made the chloroboral radical first. We've made many of these compounds with a the keg and they're perfectly stable um, under um, inert atmosphere, of course. You can, you can make them on a gram scale. Um, and they're nice paramagnetic species. You can store them under nitrogen or under argon as you wish. Um, and then when this compound is, is, is reduced further to the borrelin, the borrelin uh, immediately interacts with the CC double bond here. Um, and in a 2 plus 1 cycloaddition forms that, um, that um, borrelin here in pretty good, in very good yields. Um, next thing, is it also possible to use an external, if you like, source of the CC double bond? So um, we've been using a normal keg and um, ethylene from the bottle. Um, and under very mild conditions, we form again um, in pretty good yields um, our borrelin from the 2 plus 1 cyclo addition of the borrelin with the CC double bond. Um, that was quite a surprise. Um, Wittig's reagent also forms the same borrelin. So what's wrong here? Um, Wittig's reagent is known to release methylene in a way, um, but um, not necessarily is known as a source um, for a C2 unit, for an ethylene or an olefin. So what is happening here? Um, we actually monitored the reaction by um, NMR, 11 boron NMR, and what we find um, is the product, compound number three, in pretty good yields. Um, we have somewhat of the precursor still left. This is the phosphine adduct here. Um, and then there's traces of an intermediate, compound two, with an 11 boron NMR shift at 28. Now, um, with optimizing these conditions, um, we could actually enrich this one here. Um, so that is always accompanied by, by other compounds like um, intramolecular um, stabiliza unwanted stabilization pro products. But anyway, we were able to increase the amount of two and grow crystals from it. And what we have is um, an alkylidine borane. So this is probably what one would expect. A borane reacts with a methylene source with formation of the methylene borane. And that then, um, in the presence of more Wittig reagent, will form eventually um, the, the borrelin. I should also say, well, this is not yet on the slide. This is very new results. I should also mention that um, now we have the first reversible reaction. Um, and this is this one here. Um, so the ring can be opened again. This compound can be heated. And then we have a cycle, it can be heated to 100 degrees C, I, I need to say, and then we have a cyclo reversion, reforming the borrelin again, and that can be trapped, say, with uh, CO. So this is the first um, example for reversible activation of a substrate at the borrelin center. And as I mentioned before, 
if we want to make this chemistry more useful, we should go for catalysis, and um, that requires, of, of course, reversibility of all the steps. We're working on that, not yet there, but you always, oops, oops sorry, you always have to have a challenge. Um, just to um, give you a, a bit of an idea where we're coming from, um, some of you may know um, the old campus, um, am Hupland, um, with the old chemistry buildings from the 1960s. Well, this is pretty much all history now. Um, and all the, all the institutes, they got um, rebuilt. Um, and this is inorganic chemistry, and that was done about five years ago. And that is the research building for boron chemistry. And that was finished about two years ago. And now we have um, much um, beautiful new lab space, more than 5,000 square meters um, for, for doing inorganic and boron chemistry. And uh, 10, 10 groups um, are hosted here with more than 150 scientists, postdoc, PhD students. Um, at the end, I would like to thank all the people who did the work, um, all my co-workers over the years in the lab, um, all our collaborators, um, a growing list of people who help with their expertise when we don't know anymore. They will help us with calculations, with me measurements, with good ideas. Um, there's all the people who were throwing their money at us. I'm very, very much indebted. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for telling us your Borilian chemistry. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Sandeep. So, Brown Swag for the great talk. I just have a quick query. Those uh, lithiated Aja Borain species, I mean, you, see, you mentioned that they are reducing enough, right? Yes. So, I just wanted to know, like, how strongly reducing they are. Can they reduce aryl halides? Um, yes, they do. Um, we, we tried, of course, um, pentafluorophenyl bromide, say, as one, exa as one substrate, right? A promising substrate, we thought. But um, either the compound does not react or um, the anine reduces the substrate. Okay. Um, so we, we, if you have a good, we even tried, and that would be cheating, but we even tried diazonium, uh, phenyl diazonium salts, right, to replace be, one yeah. and two with the other. Um, didn't work. That didn't work at all. Um, okay. there, and this is why I said that the students were very um, desperate to get something working, and this is why they took acetic acid and hydride. That works, but this is not what we wanted. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Omita. Thank you for the nice talk and Hati's congratulations on the award. Thank you. Um, couple of questions. Sure. First is the, uh, the carbon monoxide in, the, in your last when methylene transfer. So how does the carbon monoxide helping uh, coordination to the borylin center? Um, the CO is, is a very good sigma donor pi acceptor. It is not as strong as a carbene but it behaves in the same way. So the borylene, when you look at the borylene, the borylene is electron poor and electron rich. It is sigma, rich in sigma electron density, poor in pi electron density, and in order to balance that, we have to have a, a sigma donor pi acceptor. And that, this is what the CO does. So the CO is stabilizing the borylene. Is, is that the answer to your question? The, the uh, phosphine group is being liberated, right? And the methylene yes. is being transferred. The methylene is being transferred, yes. Yeah. Finally yeah, finally making the B double bond CH2. This one. Ah, okay. Yes. Um, here, yeah. that, that guy was just used as um, um, the borylene source. I mean, so we've been using that. This is a defined compound. You can weigh it in. Um, and then you release the CO by photolysis, generating the borylene. So this was our means to facilitate the borylene, which is a very short-lived species. So this is like, like this one. Sorry, now I'm getting you. I'm yeah, because sorry. last last slide you use PM3 to stabilize right, we use it. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we use something else. So yes. this this goes. Sorry, back to that one. That goes. So this was that was an important finding. We have a borylene carbonyl. Mm -hmm. And we treat it like iron pentacarbonyl. We irradiate it, and it, it releases the CO. And we have the short-lived borylene intermediate, and we can do chemistry with it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and similarly, so that goes with irradiation. When we use the phosphine, I mean phosphine is also a good ligand in transition metal chemistry. And when we use the, pho sorry, the phosphine, and that was here, yes. um, same story. We use this guy as the source for the borelin, but now not with irradiation, but with heating. So we heat that, the phosphine goes out, um, generates the short-lived borelin, and this can be trapped. This is what I meant with the opti optimization of the condition. So we do this right. with thermolysis and the other one under photolysis. Right. I get it, yeah. Yeah, thanks. One more, Ken? Quick, yes, quick, yeah, quick quickly. One. So uh, there's borylene and uh, dinitrogen complexes. That's wonderful. I also teach in my lectures the entire Thank morning. Thank you very much. Right, cycle. And uh, uh, so is there an option to uh, stabilize a P2 unit between the borylene centers? Uh, we, we, we tried, but only half-heartedly, I must admit. We should try harder. I think, yes, something is happening. We have not yet fully characterize what is coming out of it, yes. Um, one idea, but we, we can't do that, would be to generate P2 at 1,000 degrees C, mm -hmm. and then um, cool it down and try to trap it with the borelin. That is also something one should do. Right. If we had somebody to generate the P2 for us. Oh, thanks. Okay, there are uh, no questions. I have just one quick question. Sure. How, or maybe two small uh, questions. How important is potassium C8 other than generating borylene also activating uh, your substrate? Right. Um, no. Um, we can also use, say, lithium. And we cannot okay. use sodium. Sodium doesn't work. Um, I don't know why. But we can also use lithium. And lith lithium works equally well. Um, okay. Depending on the conditions, the lithium favors the formation of the B2 and 4 species. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, there are uh, several lithium uh, adductoids no. also there. I'm sorry, I lost it. Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. So I, I, the, lith I, the lithium um, favors the, the, the borelin and four species under certain conditions, but apart from that, it works equally well. And, and finally, on the question of reversibility, uh, you have uh, some prospect of oxidative addition type reaction, but yes. how do you achieve reductive elimination what is the how what would be your strategy there the the, the, the attempt when we, this is why we did of course the 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 amine activation we wanted to make the bora buckwald hartwig reaction but it didn't work okay. so that was definitely an attempt um and that would actually have also started to close the cycle of our yeah, reaction that, that right so start at the end and this was our intention so we can activate nh very good very well but we cannot transfer the NH to any substrate. Mm. This is the wrong type of boralin. We have to generate or we have to facilitate other borelines with and weaker transfer. bonds, and they that probably, hopefully, will act as catalysts. Close, close the cycle. Yes. OK, wonderful talk, wonderful Thank discuss. You. Yeah, please. Sure. To get a yeah, resonance structure between the boron and uh, nitrogen, you, you are, is it possible to separate the charges by I any means? A yeah, kind of a resonance type of structure between to the boron and the charge. Yeah. No, it's all delocalized. It is delocalized. Okay. If this is what you mean, yes. Mm, mm. This is all delocalized. Okay. Okay. So it is possible to separate the resonance structure type of charge separation between the boron and nitrogen? I don't think so, no. Okay. Probably okay. I'm not getting your question, I must admit. What, what do you mean with charge separation? I mean, I mean yeah, resonance structure, because you have the boron mm -hmm. and nitrogen yeah, delocalization. So is it possible to have nitrogen accepting the yeah, nucleophile or boron accepting the... Ah, ah I see. Now yeah. I see. No, yeah. um, unfortunately not. Um, these compounds nice as they are, mm. um, don't show a very rich chemistry. <coughs> now I get you. No, that was not possible. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was quite disappointing, I must okay. admit. Okay. Okay. Great. But yeah. you can't have it all, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Before I conclude, I have a few more uh, duty to perform. Uh, may I now request Professor Uday Maitra to deliver a moment to, to Professor Banshee.
much. Thank you. So let me formally conclude uh, this talk. Please join me thanking the speaker again uh, on our behalf. Oh, oh, yeah. Please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, one more. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we must thank the chairperson and in a special way. morning the second session of today and this session will be chaired by professor sc siva subramonian and professor ajay kumar shah both of them are from bits pilani pilani campus thank you in this session we have okay, in this session we have four lectures uh, due to paucity of time I will be very quick in this. I request Professor D.S. Rawat to deliver the lecture first. He is from Department of Chemistry, University of Delhi. He has many academic accolades, but due to paucity of time, I am not mentioning that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me over here, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar and Mirasai, for giving me this opportunity to present some of our work over here. Uh, I am from University of Delhi, but uh, right now I am on deputation, and uh, my new place of work is at Kumar uh, University Nainital. Let me just uh, show you a couple of slides about uh, my university and the city from where I am coming right now. Uh, so this is uh, my new address, this is the Kuma University, Admi uh, this is the administrative block of the university. And this is uh, the administrative block, uh, this is where my office is located. And uh, we have nine faculties, uh, 33 departments, sanctioned post to 2,205, 83 colleges and student strength is about 70,000 and we have two campuses. And my accommodation is uh, behind this tree actually. And it's very scenic place, but I have a very good companion there, and at night time I'm advised not to come because we have a couple of lepers in the campus. And uh, this is the uh, main uh, campus called DSB campus, and all the academic departments are over here. And another campus is about one hour drive from Nanital. And this is the beautiful city of Nanital, it's a lake city. and. Uh, this is where the administrative block is located, and this is our uh, uh, DSB campus, the main campus, and uh, this is scattered actually, it's in a hill area, and uh, the geology department, some part of chemistry department is on the top of this part, and the governor house is somewhere here, on that side. But uh, winters are very cold, snow a lot at times, and this year, the snowing has started a little bit, but we are expecting more snow, and it looks like this. But nights are very beautiful uh, in the summertime. If you visit, it's a very scenic place. And uh, this is the classroom, MSc classroom. I started taking uh, classes of MSc students, and this is the class where I studied actually way back in 1993. Uh, this was the same classroom where I, I was a student. Uh, so let me just uh, move uh, what I wanted to talk to you today. That we all know that uh, organic chemistry started from synthesis of urea, and first synthetic uh, molecule, medicinal molecule, is called chloral hydrate, and this is used as sedative hypotonic. And 1887, the, these kind of molecules were used for analgesic and antipyretic. And now the latest molecule that has come to the market is for the treatment of uh, type one, type two diabetes. So organic chemistry has made a lot of impact on human life, and this is what is reflected in the slide. In 1900, the average life at birth in India was about 23.5 years. 
and which has gone up about 65 years now in 2000, and chemistry has uh, made a bigger role, chemistry and biology interface on this. So before uh, going to talk, uh, all the medicinal chemists who are working in this year would like to show this slide and how tedious, how difficult it is to develop a drug molecule. When an organic uh, chemist synthesizes 10,000 compounds, one compound comes to the market as a drug, and it takes about 15 to 17 years, and the cost is $460 million, average cost. So it's tedious, time-consuming, and costly affair. These are the uh, approaches in drug discovery. We talk about target-based drug discovery, repurposed drug discovery, rational drug design, and hybrid drug. So I will present on this hybrid drug uh, discovery today, and which is, uh, has been now talk of the town. People are starting working on this. Before this, let me just show you this slide. This is, this is the plant we all see all over. And this plant has been a source of 70 alkaloids. And out of which, I have shown two of the structure of the two alkaloids over here. And these alkaloids have shown poor anti-cancer activity, but same plant generated two more alkaloids. When these are connected by this single bond, this is called vincristine or vinblastine if you have methyl here in place of formate. And this molecule, these two molecules were uh, licensed by US FDA for the treatment of leukemia. And Professor Mehta has summarized a beautiful article in uh, 2002 where they mentioned that natural products arising through mixed biosynthesis have found exhibit unusual properties and biological activity. But synthetic medicinal chemists never utilized this approach. But after 1995 or 96, people started working on it. And our approach was a little bit simpler one. What we did actually, we used this part of chloroquine, which is a drug for the treatment of malaria, and this part of pyrimethamine and cyclogonin, these two molecules were also used as a drug for treatment of malaria way back in 1960. What we did, we hybridized these two. We took this part of chloroquine and this part of pyrimethamine and cyclohexone techniques, and they connected from the linker. So chemistry-wise, it's a simple. So when these molecules were synthesized, I will concentrate only on uh, this part of the molecule today. So this is the molecule what we synthesized the initially. So what we did here, uh, this four amino quinoline, and we have a triazine, and we have a linker. So what we proved here, this is the IC50 value of chloroquine, and this is the IC50 value of our compound. So what we proved here, that if you hybridize two of the pharmacophores, the activity of resulting hybrid molecules can be tuned much better way than the standard drug chloroquine. So with this data in hand, what we thought next to substitute this nitrogen by CH, making it as a pyrimidine hybrid, and this is where the synthesis is. So we got two regioisomers here, and purification of these two regioisomers is little bit tedious. We purified this, X-ray structure was determined, and then this CL was substituted by carbocyclic amine. So let me show you the structure activity relationship between these set of molecules. So the, the, the difference between these two regio isomers is the connectivity of the linker between these two pharmacophores. In this case, this linker is connected with the carbon flanked by two nitrogen. In this case, it is at this carbon. But if you look at the antimalarial activity of these two set of regio isomers, it is almost identical. So that was a good thing because we moved forward with the major isomer what we had, we converted these kind of molecules. So when this CL was substituted by this amine, cyclic amine, the activity was improved 10 times. Moving from this to morpholine, the activity remains the same. From morpholine to N-ethyl fibrogen, the 6 nanomolar. N-methyl fibrogen, N-ethyl fibrogen, both has almost equal activity at nanomolar. No toxicity, so people talk about the invisibility of those compounds. So in vivo, 30 mg per kg body weight for three days, 80% cure without any toxicity. Next design was, this compound is called amodiapine, was considered to be better than chloro in 1960, but it was withdrawn after some time from the market. The reason for the withdrawal was the formation of this kind of metabolite in liver in presence of P450 cytochrome enzyme. 
And this kind of chemistry was already known in the paracetamol metabolism. Paracetamol is also liver toxic at higher dose because of this kind of conversion in the liver. So if you want to have avoid this kind of metabolite, you can do two things. Strike the position of these two groups or substitute this OS by a smaller group like this. So it was proved that if you do that, you don't get this metabolite, so toxicity is minimized. So what we did here, we used this part of fluoroamodiapine, and this part was used from our previous study, and we found, and the molecule was much better active and less toxic and 100% cure of the malaria paradox. So at that time when we published in uh, the paper in ACS Medicinal Chemistry later in 2012, we received one email from Professor Kim from McLean Hospital. He wanted to screen these compounds for the Parkinson model what he has given us. The motivation for that study was, this paper, paper published in Nature in 1987, it concludes that chloroquine or related molecules can retard the progression of Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, it was not pursued further. Professor Kim did a high throughput screening of 960 FDA approved drugs and found three hits. All the three hits had poor amino pharmacopoeia. So with this, we started collaborating with Professor Kim in 2012. And let me just show you what the Parkinson's. Parkinson is a, all you know, is a neurodegenerative disorder. It affects more than 10 million people worldwide. It does not have any cure. Right? Uh, only the L-DOPA based compounds are given and that manages the disease, but it doesn't cure. And once the disease advances, uh, the, the treatment becomes useless. And this is the healthy normal human being. You have a dopamine neuron. If you have a dopamine neurons are healthy, you will have enough number of dopamine in your brain, your movement is good. And this is the another protein, alpha synuclein. But when the Parkinson's disease happens, what happens is dopamine neurons death takes place. Once the dopamine neuron death takes place, you don't have a dopamine, enough dopamine, so movement disorder will be there. At the same time, this protein undergoes for misfolding from this kind of lung. So that aggravates. So you want to develop a molecule which can cure the Parkinson's disease, you can do two things. One, either stop the death of these dopamine neurons, or don't allow this protein to misfold like this. These are the two major targets for Parkinson's drug screening. So we started working with uh, Professor Kim in 2012. The project was funded by MJ Fox Foundation. And initially screening, we identified three hits. Interestingly, when you have a trigene versus pyrimidine, all the trigene-based compounds are totally inactive. So only the pyrimidine and aminoclin-based hybrids were active. So this is the structure activity relationship studies. This is the EC50 value for chloroquine, which is about 50 micromolar. But our compounds EC50 value is as low as 0.5 nanomolar. So if you compare these structures, all these ones. So you have a morphine here and flexible linker. But in this compound, we have a flexible linker and we have an ethyl piprazine at the both there. And the EC50 value was 0.5 nano. These are another series of compounds where we uh, proton uh, make this tertiary nitrogen, alkylation of this, made these kind of hybrid molecules. All of these compounds. One of the compounds has EC50 value less than 0.1 nanomolar. So all these are in vitro. So when you have an in vitro result, people will certainly ask you about in vivo data, whether they replicate in vivo or not. So this is the uh, luciferase enzyme assay, the mechanism, how it acts. So the NER1 enzyme was considered to be uh, the, uh, the binding pocket is very tight. It used to be called as orphan receptor, which does not have a binding pocket. But now, people have identified the binding pocket, but which is very tight. So what it does, the ligand bind, uh, this is the ligand bind uh, domain of NER1, luciferase enzyme assay. Our compounds activates this five-fold more than chloroquine. When you take the full length of NER1 
enzyme, the same result were obtained. And this is the vehicle, these red dots denotes the dopamine neurons. And when this is treated with a compound called MPPP plus or LPS, you can see the red dots are gone now, very less number of letters. What does it indicate? It indicates the death of the dopamine neuron. When this is treated with chloroquine, some of the dopamine neurons regenerated here. But when this was treated with our compound, you can see more of the red. So what we proved by this study that the death of the dopamine neuron was arrested. As a result, the dopamine consumption increases and that helps to treat the Parkinson's disease. So this is the, uh, the serotonin part of the brain of a mice. And when this was infected with a compound that causes Parkinson's disease, this is the structure of the compound, you can see how the serotonin part of the brain looks like this. When this was treated with L-DOPA, there's not much difference because it doesn't cure. But when this was treated with our compound, this part, you can see the first and the last figure. Both look identical. So what we proved here that it does cure the Parkinson's disease. That is number one. Number two, this is with the alpha syniculin. So alpha syniculin also contributes a large to a large extent to the Parkinson's disease. So what we proved here, when this is treated with our compound at a very low dose of five milligram per kg body weight this rescued the mice in one month treatment disease. And the beautiful uh, mechanism what we observed is that it induced the autophagy. So autophagy, I don't know whether the students know about it or not. For autophagy, there was a Nobel Prize in 2016 to a Japanese problem. Autophagy is when your cells are under stress, it clears your cellular garbage. So that's the mechanism. The, this molecule induces the autophagy also. What it does, you can see this, this is a yellow dot and the uh, red dots here. The cells are under stress. So when this was treated with this compound which stops the autophagy, all the red dots are gone. When this is treated with chloroquine, some of the red dots came because the chloroquine is known to inhibit the autophagy. But our compound induced the autophagy also. So this molecule acts in three different pathways. Number one, it activates the nerve one receptor, stops the death of the dopamine neuron. Number two, it stops the aggregation of alpha syncline and it induces autophagy. So where we are here right now, we are here that our molecule has entered to phase one clinical trial and the result was recently published in Nature Communication. It activates nerve one, stops the aggregation of alpha syncline, it helps in autophagy. And this is the structure of the compound which has been uh, licensed. So ultimate happiness for any chemist is that your compounds are listed in the website of this pharmaceutical industry as a lead molecule. So the first one has entered the phase one clinical trial. These two have just uh, started in the preclinical studies for autoimmune disorder and Lewy body dementia. So uh, these are the news on the website of uh, the company. We have uh, Narwan, Hanon Pharma, and Dying have started the phase one clinical trial. And this was covered by Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal. And this is the code of our compound. And in between, because the medicinal chemistry takes a lot of time and students get you know, demotivated, so we started working on the methodology and catalysis also made significant contribution in this area. Some of the work was highlighted in the cover case and some of the work was highlighted by Synfact also. And the work which I showed you, the malaria was collaborated with Dr. Shamana Khan from University of Mississippi. And the Parkinson's work was with Dr. Kim at Harvard Medical School and McLean Hospital. And this is the number of students who contributed uh, to this uh, success story. And this is the current batch of students. These two students are going to submit the PhD thesis. And Shiva will be continuing on this project because we have to generate the second generation molecule. And thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Rawat. Thank you, Dr. Rawat. We have time for two questions.
one or two. Farbaco force, and uh, you got very interesting uh, improvement in the activity, like from micromolar to nanomolar. So, have you looked at the the other part alone as such? Yes, yes. It, uh, and it was active or no? Uh, if you take aluminium part hmm. or the pyrimidine part, pyrimidine the, part, the activity was very, very, okay. and then you do the one is to one combination also, the activity was less. It is only when these molecules are covalently linked like this, the activity. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Uh, sir, I just wanted to know, was there any computational studies? Can computational study predict that which part of, you know, uh, which active compound will uh, be able to combine and give more? Uh, uh, we did that, but no, computational studies are dicey. Sometimes they give the desired results, sometimes it doesn't. So you cannot even 100% say, if the this is what computation is said, it will come the same. We did that one. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rawat. I think we have this time. Our next speaker is Professor Deepak Salunke from the Department of Chemistry and Center of Advanced Studies in Chemistry at Punjab University, Chandigarh. I welcome Dr. Salunke. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, indeed, it is a great pleasure uh, to be here and present this talk. I'm thankful to the organizing committee and pro especially Professor Anil Kumar for providing this opportunity. So today I will talk about some of our work we, uh, we are doing at Punjab University Chemistry Department about structure activity relationship to identify a human toll like receptor 7 agonist, which is we are uh, exploring it as an effective adjuvant for COVID-19 vaccine. I'm very I would like to dedicate this talk. This is my first talk at CRSI, and I would like to dedicate this to Professor Dr. Brajagopal Hajra, uh, my mentor, my supervisor uh, at NCL Pune. Uh, we lost him a couple of years back, uh, but then he's the one. Uh, as a uh, as a PhD student, I presented poster almost every year at CRS, uh, CRSI meetings, and this is my first time I am presenting talk. So uh, I cannot actually. This is like. Uh, I cannot forget uh, the, the, the training he, he gave me at uh, NCL Pune. So uh, when we talk about vaccine development, like uh, we all are, we are like face such a, a, a bad time and this, this COVID-19, because of COVID-19 and, but then this time there's a good thing and bad thing. Definitely I, I, I cannot say that it's a good time, but as a researcher, I think we all should be uh, like happy that in this last two, two to three years time, we have learned so much. There is so much of advancement because of this, uh, uh, like because whenever there is a attack, like we are like trying to get equipped and uh, doing something. So uh, in terms of vaccines, uh, there was huge uh, like uh, improvement because you see there are different kinds of uh, vaccines which are like developed uh, like against COVID-19, uh, almost like all different times you can see that uh, like the, the viral vector vaccines were developed, which came into the market in very quickly within like, uh, six months time. Then a whole uh, virus vaccines, like these are the like uh, classic, maybe first generation vaccines. They were also introduced uh, like to take care of uh, COVID-19. Then also like the protein or peptide subunit vaccines, like they were introduced uh, like uh, to take care of COVID-19. Also, uh, the new generation or which we call it as second generation or third generation uh, these are the second generation vaccine the protein subunit vaccines then the third generation vaccines or when we are reaching to fourth generation vaccines so this could happen because of this uh, like uh, tremendous pressure uh, human uh, mankind had 
to take care uh, against this uh, infection. So then, a DNA, uh, DNA vaccines were also introduced. Also, there are nanoparticle and virus-like uh, like particle vaccines were introduced against COVID-19. As an Indian researcher, I feel very happy because India is the only country almost like we have a vaccine, FDA approved vaccines or like the vaccines which are approved in one or more countries from India. You can see that uh, this uh, Corbivax, so Corbivax uh, is, a, is a like uh, a protein subunit based vaccine which is uh, actually uh, invented by uh, Texas uh, Children's Hospital in uh, collaboration with Dynavax and it, it is then licensed to uh, Biological E uh, India, which uh, we are doing production of it. Why I am telling about the few of these, because there are many vaccines, but I, what I wanted to tell you is about what is the contribution of an organic chemist in this field. And you can see that Corbivax uses aluminum hydroxide gel uh, with CPG1018 as an adjuvant. So I wanted to, I wanted uh, like you all to look at this component that what is adjuvant. The next one uh, is like the uh, Gemcovac. Gemcovac is the first mRNA vaccine uh, by India. And uh, the, this is the, uh, this is adsorbed on the surface of the nanolipid emulsion. The mRNA vaccines, the problem with the mRNA vaccine is, is stability. You need to have a, a, a good uh, like uh, a temperature control for its uh, like uh, good application. But then uh, this Gemcovac, like they tried to improve uh, the stability of this mRNA vaccine by using this uh, by using this nanolipid emulsion, which also plays a role of an immune potentiator. Then comes this uh, Zycov D. This is a DNA plasmid uh, vaccine by Cadilla Healthcare. They uses unmethylated CPG as an adjuvant here. So again, there is an another kind of adjuvant. We saw that there is the people have used alum. Then we saw people have used CPG. Okay, so like that, this is unmethylated CPG is also being used in a DNA vaccines. Then come uh, is uh, Incovac. Incovac uh, is an intranasal vaccine. Uh, this is an adenovirus vectored vaccine with a prefusion stabilized spike protein. It is a almost similar technology like Covishield and it is introduced by Bharat Biotech. So, and then uh, like the Covaxin is an uh, inactivated coronavirus injected along with the imidazoquinoline based uh, like a small molecule adjuvant which actually activate through toll like receptor 7 and 8. So all this, so these adjuvants what I am telling, it is not something new. You can see that adjuvants are introduced in vaccines uh, like way back in 1920s and alum is the first adjuvant introduced. You can see that many, you can, uh, these are the red dots are the one which are without adjuvants and the blue ones are the adjuvanted ones. So adjuvants are being used, uh, but then, uh, they are, so what is so special about adjuvants, why the adjuvants are required in vaccines and what is vaccination, that is all is very important to understand. So as a chemist, uh, just to cut uh, this story a little short, I just wanted to tell you that adjuvants, they actually improve the vaccine response broadening, they, they improve the rapid response to pathogens, they reduce the number of immunizations, and important thing is the dose sparing. So when there is a pandemic, we needed many millions of billions of doses of vaccines, so that time uh, and any molecule, any technology where you can reduce the dose of the vaccine is going to be a very crucial, and that's why the adjuvant technologies became very, very useful for developing COVID-19 vaccines because we needed a more amount of vaccines in a very short time. So if you look at the history of vaccine, uh, like uh, adjuvant development, uh, okay, so you can see that the alum-based adjuvants were introduced like somewhere in 1920s, this would be 1923, uh, and then later you can see that only in 1997, uh, like, like uh, this Novartis introduced oil in water emulsion as an adjuvant, MF59. This is about around six to seven decades. Alum was the only mineral salt used as an adjuvant uh, throughout the world. But MF59 was introduced only in Europe because its mechanism of action was not very clear. So it was not approved in USA. Later, GSK introduced AS04, AS03, and AS01. AS04 is monophosphoryl lipid A, 
uh, uh, which is adsorbed on alum. So this is the only I'm talking about adjuvant part. So this is introduced by GSK. Then comes AS03, which is used for influ influenza vaccines, which has alpha tocopherol uh, with uh, oil and water emulsions. So you can see that people are going with alum and combination with some molecules, and these, these, these molecules are nothing but immune potentiators. And then AS03 uses saponin, matrix M as an adjuvant. Then comes is uh, uh, like, uh, uh, you can see in 2017 for hepatitis, CPG1018, which is uh, like CPG oligodinucleotides were also uh, utilized uh, as an adjuvant. And then very recently, uh, like uh, Bharat Biotech introduced uh, this uh, TLA78 based compounds. And I'm very proud to say that uh, this technology was taken by from my supervisor uh, from uh, from University of Kansas, and I worked on this molecule. So because of that connection, uh, like as a consultant to Bharat Biotech, I could help them uh, synthesize this small amount of adjuvant uh, during the lockdown. So the, I, I felt so happy about it. Uh, so what are these molecules? So these are all the pattern. Uh, this, this would be PRR. This is pattern recognition targeting molecules. So. So these molecules, they target pattern recognition receptors and activate the immune system. So pattern, so the, the, this uh, like uh, identification or discovery of pattern recognition re receptors, specifically TLR4, uh, the this discovery like uh, Professor Butler and Professor Hoffman, they got like half of the share of the 2011 Nobel Prize. Uh, and then Professor Sinman also got half of that uh, Nobel Prize uh, award for the discovery of dendritic cells and their role in adaptive immunity. So these pattern recognition receptors, these are part of the like specialized immune cells. And uh, like, uh, the, like for example, there are array of toll-like uh, uh, like, uh, receptors. So these are the transmembrane receptors. So there are like, uh, uh, like uh, 13 toll-like receptors known so far, out of which are 10 are found to be functional in humans. And you can see that few of the uh, toll-like receptors, like there are 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, and 11, they are on the they are like on the the membranes of these uh, macrophages and dendritic cells uh, most uh, predominantly and TLR3, 7, uh, 8, and 9 they are present at the uh, endolysosomal compartments. Also, there are few uh, like pattern recognition receptors like NOD. They are also present in the cytosols. So we work on TLR2, TLR7, 8. We just started TLR9 also, and we are working on NOD2. So these are the molecules which we are synthesizing in my lab. So how they work? So these molecules, so, so as I said, toll-like receptors are expressed on the uh, macrophages. Uh, they are activated by the PAMs, which is pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So these are the molecules from the microbes. Uh, like the, because of this activation, there is the production of cytokine production lead to the maturation of dendritic cells, and then it in turn uh, leads to the activation of the uh, like the, the adaptive immune systems. So TLRs play a job to link innate and ad adaptive immune system. So what I wanted to emphasize here is that the alum provokes a strong TH2 kind of response, and then these immune potentiators, they provoke small, strong TH1 kind of response. And these new generation vaccines, they mostly are looking for an adjuvant, which can have a balanced TH1, TH2 kind of response. That's why Bharat Biotech used alum in combination with TLR7 targeting molecule. Okay, so what we are doing in my lab, so as I uh, like uh, told you so far, uh, there are PAMs, and these PAMs are useful as an adjuvants, and then uh, there are vaccine part, so which we don't work here, so we work mostly on the preparation of adjuvants, and then overall idea is to prepare a, 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 a mimic, a, a, a material which can mimic microbes, and which will have antigen as well as adjuvants as a complete vaccine. So we, we, we work on synthesis of toll-like receptor uh, agonists. We work on development of nano-self assemblies. And then we work on self-adjuanting vaccines, as well as development of new adjuvant combinations. So uh, overall, we uh, like apart from vaccines, we work on immunochemotherapy, antimicrobial steroids, and also some work in material chemistry. So today I'll talk about TLS 7-8. So in TLS 7-8, if you see, what we looked at, we, we did a complete literature survey and found that there is a pharmacophore which is responsible for the specific TLR7 uh, or 8 activity. You can see amidine amine and these uh, imidazole nitrogens are very, very useful, uh, important part of the pharmacophore. So based on looking at the huge structures, we decided that uh, this imidazole quinoline molecule 
should be the starting point uh, because we were looking for a molecule which is TLR7 specific but do not have TLR8 activity because TLR8 is leads to pro-inflammatory cytokine induction. So in, uh, in that relation, we looked at the literature and found that this molecule's activity is reported. It is good adjuvant or good uh, cytokine uh, like uh, induction, like inter interferon gamma induction, but its TLR8 activity was not clearly known. So we synthesized this molecule. So before that, we looked at the literature and we found that what are the uh, ways we can make this molecule. We observed that uh, Professor Ferguson, like he came up with this approach, multi-component approach where amino maronitrile uh, is uh, with the uh, orthoesters and amine can be converted to uh, like substituted uh, like imidazoles, which on then uh, Tanmer reaction was converted to iodo followed by uh, coupling with Suzuki. Coupling was got to this uh, intermediate D, which can be converted to the desired imidazole phenolins. In this one, the, there was issue because at the university settings when I started at the at Punjab University, there was fund crisis, so we wanted to have a, a, a method which is easily doable and uh, like cheaper. Then we can look at the, uh, like Dr. David's work, where he used 2,4-phenolin diol uh, or anthalic acid as the starting substrate. Uh, so in this reaction, there were some uh, issues like, like anthalic acid was a drug precursor used for the preparation of uh, metha, uh, 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 Methoxylone, as well as there is a requirement of acetic anhydride in this process. So we, we thought that maybe we can optimize this process. So my student Dipender, the most of the work today I'm presenting is of his him. And so we started this process. Uh, so we started with thalamide because this was a Vogel procedure and uh, in our department, our BSc students used to do this anthralic acid preparation. So we thought why not to prepare our own anthralic acid because we are unable to buy it at India. And then we start uh, optimize this process. Then uh, depend that this complete total synthesis of the BBIQ molecule. Because of time constraints, I will just go quickly. And then we looked at this molecule. Uh, uh, Professor Petrovsky uh, from Australia, he screened our molecules. He also has a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, which is approved in Iran. So we observed that the BBIQ, you can see it is a TLR7 active, but no activity in TLR8. So it is a TLR7 specific. So it is first time we confirmed that this activity. Because of our this paper, Bharat Biotech could approach us and then we could help them in the synthesis of the uh, like uh, covaxin adjuvant. So we, we took, then we took this molecule and screened as an uh, uh, useful adjuvant in the influenza vaccine using recombinant hemagglutinin as an uh, uh, like uh, uh, antigen. And we observed that it, it increased a good IgG2C response. So we looked at IgG1 and IgG2C because they are the markers for, uh, for showing the TH1 and TH2 kind of a response. Uh, then uh, as an uh, one point uh, like uh, modification to understand the SAR, we did modification at the C4 position. We, can, we prepared chloro, methoxy and hydroxy using a similar protocol. So where we substitute the, the hydroxy, we convert hydroxy to chloro, then do a substitution with different amines and then install the uh, required amine by using an oxidation followed by reaction with benzoyl isocyanate. So it is a typical proto protocol we follow for each synthesis. So you can see that in these molecules, the hydroxy molecule, which is 9C, was the most active. It was more active than Resicumod, the standard, and uh, like uh, the other compounds. So whereas there is a methoxy and chloro, the activity is lost. So the presence of hydrogen bond donor is important. That is what we understood. Then we did one more set of modification where we, we, uh, kind of, we installed ester terminal amides as well as prepared uh, like a few more analogs. Uh, and then we observed that, we thought that this, uh, this hydrazide might show better activity, but overall in this SAR we could observe that uh, like uh, compound 11 with a small, uh, like, uh, the compound 12, uh, compound uh, 11 was totally inactive because it was ester. Uh, then this box compound was 15 was uh, relatively active. Compound 12 was also quite active. Uh, but then you can see that there is a, some activity of TLR8 in compound 12. So this uh, terminal amide was found to be dual active with less TLR8 activity. So uh, to extend SAR, then we, we prepared some more amides and we chose these amines based on the uh, the, the known uh, like uh, uh, scaffold from the uh, imicumod, acicumod, and gadicumod, and uh, and we observed that some of these molecules, the best molecule what we got was the was this 
hydroxymethyl, where the, uh, the active compound, compound was quite well, PLS7 active, you can see uh, compound 23, so it, it was quite well active, the most active, and it had very, very less PLA8 activity. We tested this mo molecule in, uh, by using uh, uh, spike as an antigen, in co and, and we could see that it gave a good IgG2 response as well as good IgG1 response. So this work uh, is under revision. So overall what I have shown you that we optimized the process for BBIQ and then, then we did a uh, SAR uh, from MEQ mod and, to, and we reached up to compound 23 in this extension SAR. So apart from this, I just quickly wanted to tell that we prepared uh, like this uh, uh, adjuvant which is used in Covaxin uh, co and we have shown that uh, this is not yet, uh, this, uh, this we are actually communicating the paper where this particular adjuvant, uh, the data is here, uh, this one is, is very good. We could see uh, even better uh, activity uh, in, in IgG2C as well as IgG1. Uh, so we want that the good response in, in both of these. So this we have tested with the uh, like uh, peptide antigens. In Covaxin it is an uh, inactivated virus. Okay, so overall I have shown you that, that, that what is the contribution of an organic chemist in the development of uh, new vaccines or new vaccine adjuvant. So I am thankful to my collaborators, Professor, uh, Professor Petrovsky in particular for this specific work. Uh, and then I am thankful to my students. Most of the work today I have shown is, is of Dependar and uh, he is currently doing postdoc at Nebraska. Uh, and uh, I am thankful to Professor Petrovsky for his uh, support to my lab. Uh, like uh, I would like to tell that there is an uh, editorial written uh, by, by me uh, like on medicinal chemistry of next generation vaccine adjuvants and we are, uh, we are inviting articles uh, in this particular uh, like uh, the, we have planned a special issue on medicinal chemistry of vaccine adjuvants. So thank you all. Thank you Professor Salamke. Thank you Professor Salamke. We have time for just one question. And recent, uh, you know, after this vaccination issue, recently we all seen there are several, you know, Artifact, attacks. Yeah, yes. So, uh, do you really think that the vaccine could be the reason behind those attacks? Because it is in, you know, all rumors are going on. So, can you throw some light on that? Yeah, if you ask anything to one who is working in the vaccine development, definitely they will say that no, it is not. But, but truly speaking, my personal opinion is that, see, now at present, almost everyone is vaccinated and almost everyone is also infected. So it is very important to collect the data that because these heart related issues are also could be because of virus itself. Because everyone is infected also. So I uh, like, uh, uh, but, but, but again now there are various different technologies, mRNA vaccines. So I am more of a promoter of an old generation, the first generation technology because I, I like more of a co-vaccine where uh, inactivated virus is used rather than the mRNA vaccines because you know that they are like uh, thrown into market like within six months. So definitely uh, like uh, a lot of data is required. Uh, looking at the number of cases, I, I also feel that there could be some uh, issues related to the technology. And uh, so I should not say that it is, it is not. So I, I think that so I, I personally feel that uh, the, the, uh, the whole inactivated kind of virus vaccines could be more uh, safe and better options uh, than mRNA vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Salanke. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Ajib Sakuja. Professor Sakuja is from Bits Pilani Pilani campus. So I request uh, Professor Sakuja to, to okay. oh, very good morning to everyone. Uh, Thank you so much for the, to the organizing committee, though I'm a part of it, but 
special thanks to Professor Anil Kumar, Professor Dilip Kumar, Professor Indresh Kumar for considering me to be a part of this special session. Thank you to CRSI also for the same. So I started my journey in this magical institute in 2012 uh, after returning from US, you know. And I must say it's really magic. I've grown up over the years and, uh, you know, I started an independent search group in 2012, where for the initial years I was working on, you know, developing some heterocyclic molecules and exploring their activities in the area of sensing, gelation, anti-cancer eff efficacy and so on. And then we started working on the concept of CH activation, which is no new to many of you, but I will give a brief background of what we started on. So the concept of, you know, carbon, carbon, or carbon nitrogen or carbon other bond formation, there are no, no new. You know, the biggest thrust I could see in my opinion came when the cross-coupling reactions was developed, you know, in 1970s onwards. And, you know, a, a functionalized or, a aryl, or halogenated aryl system was conjugated or coupled with, you know, organometallic compounds with the aid of platinum catalyst. And eventually later, you know, other metal catalysts were developed and they did the same job in a beautiful way. So around 30, 35 years, you know, this, this chemistry was widely explored, you know, and three eminent scientists got the Nobel Prize in 2010 for the same. And from there, you know, uh, the chemistry of CH activation emerged where the major difference was that you start with a non-functionalized or non-pre-functionalized starting material and you do organometallic chemistry, try to couple different coupling partners to form CC bond or CN bond formations over the years. And now it's been like almost 20, 25 years, this chemistry has been well, well explored and functionalization happened with, you know, a variety of coupling partners to different heterocycles, uh, aromatic compounds, and even more biomolecules as well. Uh, of course, both these strategies have their own advantages and disadvantages. In the interest of the time, I'm not going in the details of all this. But then, uh, you know, over the years, uh, you know, when you need to attach a particular coupling partner on an aromatic and a heteroaromatic group, you know, the typical conventional chemistry is you have a electron donating group and activating group, which by a typical electrophilic substitution reaction can do the same. But then there is a limitation. We cannot attach any coupling partner. And then the concept came of the concept that why don't we attach or a typical directing group which aids in a neighboring unactivated CH1 and try it with the help of metal catalyst, try to, you know, attach or functionalize an unactivated CH1. And this concept which is today known as directing group aided chelation assisted CH functionalization is well in demand and people have been working uh, over the years, uh, last few years in this area. Of course, the directing group can be introduced at a later stage and can be removed or your system can itself contain the inbuilt directing group. With the same concept, you know, uh, eminent scientists all over the world have actually explored the various directing group functionality and also a, a variety of heterocyclic molecules towards this concept where you have a directing group on a system and, you know, with the help of that, you activate a neighboring unactivated CH bond with the help of a metal catalysis, forming a five-member, six-member, even seven-member transition state. And with the help of a functional group, you know, inducing reagent or with the help of a coupling partner, you either lead to a CH functionalization or an annulated product. So with this idea, we also started uh, this project uh, with the support of SCRB in 2018 on these two specific systems, thalazinones and uh, indazolones, uh, we see that there is an inbuilt uh, indolic group in both of them, and we assumed, we envisioned that we could aid CH functionalization in the neighboring CH, and with the help of this amidic NH, we can do a number of coupling partners, and we can make a variety of bioactive, uh, tetracyclic, uh, pentacyclic, annulated products. So over the years of next four years, we synthesize a variety of functionalized and fused systems where we started working with different coupling partners, diazonium chloride, uh, diazo compounds, acrylates, uh, internal alkynes, aryl ca carbonates. We did a variety of examples over here and you could see we prepare, you know, uh, alkyl esters, uh, alkyl ketones, amides, uh, cyclic carbonyls. This was done with the help of aryl isocyanates. Uh, introduction of succinamide, uh, acrylates and we have uh, sinolines preparations and so on. So we did this work uh, over the next four years from 2018 to 2022. And now, now very recently we started working two years back on the extension of this project on biomolecules, more specifically on amino acids and bile acids. 
So today's talk, I'm concentrating specifically on the CH functionalization, on the amino acids to prepare modified amino acids. Why there is a need for modified amino acids? That's very, very important. So we all know our bodies are made up of so many of proteins and peptides, and most of these are made up of, you know, amino acids. But then there is a big problem with these amino acids and peptide bonds, and they are uh, very prone to get hydrolyzed. And it has been understood, well understood, that you know, if there is a modification in these amino acids, then such amino acids, they are you know, more stable towards these proteolytic enzymes. And as a result, in recent four or five years, a large number of uh, modified amino acids have come up. Even naturally, you know, there are a number of uh, modified amino acids which do exist uh, naturally in our body, and also they've been synthesized. And these are some examples, more specifically with respect to phenylalanine, uh, tyrosine, and tryptophan. And I think we all know how important uh, L-DOPA role plays in our body. Uh, also, when we see more specifically towards phenylalanine, alanine, and tyrosines, so you see, you know, specific functionalization, let's say C3 in tyrosine or phenylalanine, and you know, also like C7, C4 positions in tryptophan. These are very, very prominent positions. And as a result, we started working on functionalizations at these positions in the last two years. Uh, when we started working, there were two groups working, prominent work, working at that time in this area. Professor Akaman, Professor Koria, Professor Ziong. But then over the years, when we were working, simultaneously other groups have also published papers in the area of functionalization at C3 position. Uh, you could see there is an acrylate uh, uh, affixed at C3 position in tyrosine. Uh, acyl group, uh, hydroxy group, O-acyl group, uh, O-acetate group uh, using PETA. And then uh, Professor Babu's group uh, published the C2 aryylation and benzylation by affixing a directing group at the end site over here. Uh, this was recently published uh, by him. So we're working, and of course we are, we are seeing who else is working in this area. So we started working in this area, and we chose two different concepts in this area to work it on. So the first strategy that we thought was to affix you know, an alkenyl group uh, at the C3 position with respect to a phenol, so that the presence of alkene and phenol can help us in an appropriate annulation with a coupling partner. That was the first strategy that we thought of. The second strategy we thought of was to affix a directing group at the phenolic OH position. And then with the help of directing group aid, chelation assist synthesis, we can affix a coupling partner at the C3 position. So we, in the last two years, we, we got two different uh, projects working on this, and I'm going to present this. The first one is, you know, fixing, uh, uh, first of all, alkenylation over here, which could be easily prepared by a two-step process, by using tyrosine, uh, by, uh, iodination followed by a Suzuki reaction to prepare this orthoalkenylated starting material. And once we prepared these starting materials on amino acids, then the next step was to undergo and uh, obtain reaction conditions to, for a 5 plus 2 annulation, with the internal alkynes to obtain this oxypene uh, mounted tyrosine derivatives. You could see we pre prepared a, a series of compounds. I must mention, this is not a typical heterocyclic work. Working with those who are working with amino acids, they would realize it's a very difficult work to achieve because working with amino acids is not easy. Especially because we start with the typical chiral center or a specific stereoisomeric form of the starting material. And the challenge is to retain you know, the stereochemistry of the amino acids. Just moving ahead, uh, with symmetrical, we also prepare a series of unsymmetrical uh, oxazepine uh, mounted uh, compounds. And you could see with variations over here, even we have a cumarin derivative. We prepare these compounds and they're completely characterized. Some of them were obtained as a mixture of regioisomer. Uh, of course, to understand the application of this strategy, we also attempted the stapling of another amino acid with tyrosine by preparing the alkanyl derivative of these, the second amino acid. And it was beautifully obtained uh, to get the corresponding staple products. And the strategy was workable for the late stage peptide functionalization on dipeptides and, and tripeptides in good or reasonably good yield. And the scale, this was scalable on a gram scale as well. Uh, we did uh, study the detailed mechanism. I'm not mentioning all the things in the interest of the time. And we understood uh, that the mechanism proceed via formation of a seven-membered Rhoda cyclic complex formation, followed by insertion, migratory insertion of an alkyne to generate this oxazepine mounted tyrosine and peptide derivatives. The second strategy or the second project, as I mentioned, was to introduce a directing group 
at the phenolic OH position and then try to do functionalization at the unactivated C3 position. So what we did is we introduced a pyridyl group at the OH position. It's a simple chemistry we can introduce with the help of I2 I2 pyridine in copper catalyst. And once we prepared this, then we try to affix melamide at the C3 position uh, by standardizing the reaction conditions. We were able to get C3 melamidation very comfortably. And you could see all different kinds of melamides possessing uh, electron donating, withdrawing, naphthyl group, alkyl group, uh, comfortably, uh, you know, used to melamide this L-tyrosine derivative. Beautifully, this strategy was extremely beautifully working on tripeptide, tripeptide, and even tetrapeptide. I must mention that most challenging part of this work was to, you know, prepare these di, tetra, and uh, tripeptides in solution phase and do the protection of the OH group. That is the most challenging part. But we could succeed, and then the corresponding melamidation also proceed in reasonably well. Further, to exemplify the application of this work, we did the stapling of amino acid by affixing melamide in the side chain at end side of different amino acids. And we prepared the corresponding C3 staple products. And very beautifully, we could successfully obtain a macrocyclized product by introducing a melamide at the end side and undergoing this macrocyclized product to form a 12-membered and a 15-membered macrocyclized product. The interesting feature of these two compounds was that though in all cases we were getting an alkenylated product, but when we performed the reaction conditions with intramolecular conditions, we could not obtain the aerylated product. We get the hydroaerylated product. We further extended this to under-oxidizing conditions, but there was no change in the reactant. So in these cases, under the experimental conditions, we obtained the hydroaerylated product. Uh, based on the, based on the uh, a series of mechanistic studies, we propose the mechanism as shown over there. It involves the formation of a cyclic intermediate, Roda cyclic intermediate, which undergoes migratory insertion to, and further oxidation to generate melamide, while in the case of intramolecular, the oxidation was not observed. Uh, the next project I'm talking about is based on the, uh, the synthesis of unnatural amino acid based on tryptophan. So please, under, I, you must, the audience must understand, you know, C2 functionalization has been well explored over the last 10 years by eminent people. You know, it's all kinds of functionalizations have been done at the C2 position in the last few years. When we talk about functionalization at C4, C5, C6, and C7, you know, very limited papers have been recently published. It's very challenging to undergo functionalization at these non or unactivated stage points. So when we started these work, these were the two papers were known, one by Professor Ma's group and one is by Professor Ackerman group, where the acrylates and amide groups were introduced at the C7 position with the aid of pinimidine and pivolyl group. And during the course of our work when we were working and standardizing, uh, the two works were published by Zeng and Liu, both of these works, introduction of melamide, though we were also working on the same system, but by the time we reached to the optimization, these two papers came and we dropped this project. But then, subsequently, we started working of introducing quinones at the C7 position because the starting material we had was the same. So we started working and soon uh, we obtained a rhodium catalyzed conditions in which we obtained uh, the C7 quinone insertion with the aid of a pivolyl group. The reason of introducing a pivolyl group is because we want to avoid or restrict the functionalization at the C2 position. And the pivotal group does that, and as a result, we obtained uh, selectively uh, the functionalization and introduction of the quinone moiety at the C7 position. And you could see we prepare a variety of compounds with unsymmetrical quinone derivatives. We did get a mixture of uh, regioisomers, which were understood uh, with the detailed uh, studies. Uh, the methodology was expanded further for the late stage peptide functionalization. Uh, but in this case, the results were not that great. With dipeptides, we get reasonably reasonable yield. With tripeptide, the yield was very low. Uh, very interesting uh, results was obtained because when we submitted the paper, the reviewers asked us to deprotect the pivotal group. And we observed that during the deprotection by simple triethylamine and methanol, what was observed is that the, the NH, the pivotal group was deprotected, but at the same time, the quinone group was reduced to the phenolic 
component. We get a mixture of these resumes. We had a hard time in identifying this, but with the help of detail, NMR, HSQ, CHMBC, we did understood this, and the reviewer accepted our uh, observations. This, uh, based on some mechanistic results, we then proposed that with the help of this Pivonile group, there is a formation of the seven-member Roda cyclic intermediate, and then followed by coordination of the Q1 moiety, followed by migratory insertion, we get the C7 aerylation molecule. We are still working on this project. Uh, the project has been funded by SERB. We are very, very thankful to them. Right now, we are working on two different aspects. One is introducing uh, aryl system and alkyl system at C7 position over here, and also on tyrosines with the help of sulfoxone emuli. I'm not showing those results, but there, there is where we are. So uh, with the constraint of time, I'd like to conclude that over the last two, three years, we have started working on this CH functionalization of amino acids. We obtained the corresponding oxyphene mounted amino acids, uh, tyrosine. Uh, C3 functionalized melamidation in tyrosines, and C7 quinone insertion at the tryptophan derivatives. Uh, I'm very, very thankful to all my students, the entire work. I started my journey 12 years back. Uh, these are my students. Five of them have already graduated. Currently, the work I presented has been carried by Narendra and Disha. They're working very hard, very hard. I'm very, very thankful to all the funding agencies since uh, my journey over here, uh, especially to SERB because the project that I'm presenting over here is being sponsored by them. Thank you so much, and thank you for your patience. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, thank you Professor Sakuja, for sticking with the time. Now we are having time for two to three questions. Yes, sir. on the relations that you showed in the beginning. So you showed a couple of examples of the hydro also. So did you see any stereo induction over there in the hydro Because you're generating another. So did you get some diastereo selectivity with the hydro uh, in, in one or two cases, we did observe a small amount of diastereomid formation in the NMR. There was formation. In fact, in amino acid case also, you know, when we introduce, uh, uh, when we have this chirality introduction or when we introduce some cases, we did observe very minute amount of uh, you know, diastereomeric formation uh, in the NMR. That was visible, but that was very less. Yeah, but then, like, did you kind of uh, try to... We did HPLC explore, also. Explore, uh, you know, actually using your amino acid as a, you know, a chiral uh, kind of uh, tag so that you can actually ha explore more asymmetric versions of... No, we haven't. Process. We haven't. We haven't. We right. have not. But Thank yes, uh, when we were working on functionalization of dipeptide, tripeptide, all the time we were observing minor peaks in the NMR due to the formation of... Uh, you know, diastereomers, we were observing those things. Yeah, but we haven't done the asymmetric version. Thank you. Yes, sir. Nice chemistry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a couple of questions. The first one is that the tyrosine modified with the seven-membered oxaheterocycle. Oxapine, right. Uh, did you look at the fluorescence properties of these molecules? Um, yes, sir, but it's not that fluorescent. Otherwise, we thought that we can uh, explore some photophysical properties of that. But it was not that, we thought that it should be, but it was not that fluorescent. Okay. Yeah. The second quick question is that do you have plans to uh, functionalize exposed residues in proteins? If uh, there are any like tyrosine or uh, tryptophan? Sir, there are, but uh, I don't have right now the collaboration to do that. It's very simple. Thank uh, you. So, uh, um, but right now, uh, I know your work on bile acids. So we are also right now working on the CH functionalization of bile acids. Thank so you. We have recently achieved the SP3H functionalization in that area also. Mm. Thank Thank you. Last question. Yeah, one, uh, instead of pivotal oil, can you use trifluoroacetyl? We can use that, sir. Even that is so reported. Easy to protect, deprotect it. Yeah, that is also true. But uh, you know, pivotal oil uh, introduction is very easy, and uh, we thought it will be easy to deprotect, but we observed a different result. But of course, we can use that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. of this conference will be delivered by Dr. Sandeep Murarka. Uh, he is uh, the professor at IIT Jodhpur. Murarka, please.
Okay, so uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the last scientific talk of this exciting conference. At the onset, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this great platform to showcase the research we are trying to pursue at IIT Jodhpur. So let me begin by introducing the research program we have established. Yeah. Uh, excuse me for the technical glitch. So, uh, what we have tried to do to establish a research program which is based on sustainable synthesis, and our prime motto is to develop novel activation modes for unsaturated pi bonds and less reactive carbon hydrogen and oxygen hydrogen bonds. To do so, we are utilizing chemical tools such as transition metal catalysis, photocatalysis, synergistic catalysis and radical chemistry which assist us in developing methods for CH functionalizations and cascade annulation. Having these chemical tools in hand, we are able to develop a, compo uh, de uh, develop a compound library which is diverse with regard to both electronics and structure. Finally, having these drug-like biologically prevalent molecules in hand, we explored the biological activity of this compound in a collaborative approach in a biological pathway of interest, either in a phenotypic screening or in a biochemical assay. So as part of this research program, we have initiated our research majorly in four different areas. One of the research is hypervalent iodine reagents, where we look into the aspects of hypervalent iodine reagents as a transfer, transferal group chemistry under different set of conditions. In the second project, we have tried to unravel the reactivity of uh, NSL oxythalamides as redox activator under majorly photo-induced con uh, conditions. Recently, we have initiated our research in the field of diagiochemistry where we elucidate their reactivity under transition metal cat catalyzed condition as well as photo-induced condition. And since we are interested in making compounds which are biologically re relevant, so we often collaborate with biologists to explore the biological efficacy of our product. So, in today's context, I have tried to, I have decided to talk about a project which will kind of uh, give you a glimpse of the holistic approach we have adopted for our research program. So as we know, uracils and azeuracils are important motifs. So uracil is one of the uh, four nucleotide bases found in nucleic acid RNA, and azeuracil is the corresponding azapyrimidone analog. Both of these class of compounds are preponderant in a variety of biologically active compounds and pharmaceutical which kind of reinforces their importance. The importance of this class of compound goes several notch higher if we look into the last year's Nobel Prize, which was given in the field of medicine and pharmacology to, uh, to, for, the for the modification of nucleic acid bases, which eventually played a crucial role for the development of mRNA vaccine for COVID-19. So we ask ourselves that can we develop site-selective sustainable methods for the modification of this class of compound, which in turn will help us to navigate through the uncharted ter territory of this chemical space. So with this pretext, I'm going to talk to you three stories. The first one is about CSP2H alkylation of azeuracils using NSL oxythalamides. So NSL oxythalamides can easily be prepared from readily available feedstock carboxylic acid and N-hydroxythalamide under standard cross-coupling conditions. These compounds are traditionally used as acyl donors for the synthesis of amides, ketones, and esters. In 1990, Okada realized that they are pre-aligned to accept an electron into the low-lying pi star orbital to form the corresponding radical anion, which upon reductive fragmentation with concomitant elimination of thalamide and carbon dioxide leads to the formation of alkyl radical, 
which then can participate in a variety of cross-coupling reactions. So when I started my independent career, I got fascinated by the plethora of reactivity this class of compounds can impart, and I wrote the first concise review which kind of portrays the activity of these compounds under non-photoinduced condition and photoinduced condition. This review was very well taken by the scientific community, which only prompted me to write the next comprehensive review, which was published in HS Catalysis in 2021. So coming back to the problem statement of alkylation of azioracyl. So if we look into the repertoire exist for the alkylation of azioracyl, we will see one of the method was developed by Kim, which uses trialkyl sulfurium iodide. But unfortunately, the method requires stoichiometric amount of strong base and as well as high temperature. But most importantly, the method was only applicable for a primary alkyl group with having eight examples. The same group developed later a beautiful exam, beautiful report of cobalt catalyzed process. But in this case as, as well, they needed a stoichiometric amount of oxidant and at high temperature. So there, is on, there was only one report where people have utilized photoredox catalyzed approach to perform alkylation, but they needed the activated alkyl group such as alpha heteroatom substituted alkyl group. So we ask ourselves, that can we have an uh, approach where we can use alkyl NSL oxythalamides as the alkyl radical progenitor to perform the alkylation on azioracyl. And we wanted to develop a sustainable process uh, which is photosensitizer free. So we decided to do an EDA approach where a suitable donor should form an EDA with NHPI ester, which in turn will uh, allow us to form an alkyl radical under photo irradiation, which can add on to the azioracyl. So with this conceptual design, we embarked on the optimization studies and after a rigorous optimization process, we kind of came up with a trimolecular cocktail of donor system comprising of sodium iodide, PPH3, and thimida, which can generate the alkyl radical from NHPI ester under very mild condition. Extensive mechanistic studies supported by computational calculations performed by Dr. Lisa Ray led us to understand that this molecule, that the transition state of the reaction comprises a tetramolecular charge transfer assembly driven complex, which is supported by like several. Uh, non-bonding interactions. Nevertheless, we explored the scope of the reaction and to our delight we found out that several primary alkyl groups derived from uh, um, um, saturated fatty acid as well as monounsaturated fatty acid could be stitched together with azioracyl. We could also append uh, NSAIs such as isozepac with the azioracyl. To our delight, secondary alkyl, al alkyl radical and as well as sterically congested tertiary alkyl radical could also be attached to azioracyl. The reaction was quite diverse with regard to azioracyl as well, where we can append uh, citronellol and menthol kind of terpenoids and we can perform our desired alkylation. And as we wanted to do, the azioridines were also compatible under the reaction condition. With this, I move on to the second story, which is about CSP2H, a relation of Azioracils using diaral iodonium reagent. So, elucidation of chemistry of hypervalent iodine reagents, in, reagents is also an important area in our research group. So, hypervalent reagents basically are they are non-toxic, easily available, and they can participate in a variety of transformation. PIDA, PIFA, Cossers reagent, difluoroiodobenzene, and diaral iodonium triflate are some of the commonly used hypervalent iodine reagents. But these reagents are most commonly used as oxidant with or without transition metal. What we wanted to do to, you know, unleash the potential of these diaral iodonium reagents under a variety of conditions as a RI transfer group. So we took a kind of a holistic approach where if you perform the uh, uh, transformation of diaral iodonium reagents under metal free condition, it kind of form a ligand associated complex which after reductive elimination or a ligand coupling process leads to the formation of this product. Other than us, Berit Olofsson and Zoltan Novak are some of the key pairs in this area. Matthew Gaunt has showed that diaral iodonium reagent in collaboration with copper can form a trivalent organofucrate reagent which, is, which kind of behaves as a aryl cation which can be intercepted with a variety of nucleophile. Recently the excited state chemistry of diaral iodonium reagents has been picked up by many others including us where it forms a radical anion by accepting an electron into the low lying pi star orbital which then can undergo fragmentations to form the aryl radical which can participate in a variety of transformation. So again, coming back to the problem statement, aryllation of heterocycle in general is a worthy problem to pick up for because these kind of compounds are prevalent in many of the biologically active compounds. But if you look into the literature, we will see majorly aryl halides and aryl diazonium salts have been used, which either require strong reducing reagent, high energy UV light, 
or they have hazardous profile associated with that. Recently, Proctor and Ritter came up with thionthrenation and diaryl benzothiazine based reagents for the aryl transfer process. What we wanted to do is to develop arylation using diaryl iodonium reagents. There are one or two reports where people have used iridium or ruthenium photoredox catalyzed process, but each kind of heterocycling substrate class require a different set of condition. And there was no ED approach known for this process. So we wanted to have a holistic approach which allowed to ar perform aryylation of heterocycles. So what we wanted to do, similar to our previous project, we adopted an EDA approach and in search of a suitable donor. So the question is, does this approach, is, is this approach known for hypervalent iodine reagents? The answer is yes. So likes of monolithics, Lagdar, and Karchawa have shown that sulfonyl hydrazines, phosphites, and aminophosphines, which are electron-rich donor systems, can form an EDA with diaryl iodonium reagents to give the corresponding compound. There was only one report where heterocycle could be aryylated with diaryl iodonium reagents through EDA to give the corresponding compound. But as you may have seen, that this process will only be applicable for electron-rich system, and it will not work with electron-deficient system. So likewise, when we did the control experiment and we reacted azuracil with diaryl iodonium reagent, the reaction did not work. We didn't get our product. The second problem in this approach is that the cage effect. So as soon as there is an ACT process takes place between two reacting partners, after traveling to probably a one or two molecular diameter, the kinetic energy gets lost and then they recombine. So that kind of limits the structural diversity of the process. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to have a suitable donor. So we, when we carried out the reaction using conventional donors such as DAPCO and DIPA, we could obtain the moderate yield only. Then we used sodium iodide and PPH3, still the remain, yield remains came on a similar level and the reaction did not complete. When we added Timida to this reaction, interestingly, the yield escalated to 68% and the reaction time plummeted to five hours. When we carried out this reaction in HF5P, we got 82% yield and finally HF5P water mixture in 440 nanometer blue LED gave us the desired product. Through computational calculation, again performed by Dr. Lisa, what we learned, that this reaction again went through the formation of a ternary complex, which was again supported by uh, the computational studies. And we also realized that the ACT process from the trimeric system, like NAI and PPS3, was less favorable as compared to 4.7 kilocalorie per mole as compared to the corresponding tetramolecular system. Nevertheless, with this optimized conditions in hand, we explored the scope of the reaction. And we found out that several structurally diverse diaryl iodonium reagents could transfer aryl group on the, uh, on the backbone of azuracil. Interestingly, we could also perform heteroaryylation on azuracil. And of course, we also tried to perform the aryylation on the completely unprotected azuracil, which kind of provides us the synthetic handle for further modification. And we could again attach several terpenoids and as well as azuridines on the backbone and can perform the reaction. Then we wanted to see the scope of this process, and we did this aryylation process on quinoxalinone. And in this case, what we did, we compared the efficacy of this method with our previously developed ruthenium photoredox catalyzed process. And what we learned is that the current EDA driven approach outperformed the previous method in case of almost every single substrate we have tested. In, importantly, the sterically demanding substrate, like the ortho substituted, and electron rich substrate were not so good under ruthenium photoredox catalyzed process, but in this case, this substrate performed excellently. Then we wanted to see that how much further we can push the envelope, and we learned that several heterocycle, as many as 12 different classes of heterocycle, including diheteroatomic heterocycles such as sinolinone, imidazopyridine, pyrazinone, and aminopyrazine, and as well as several other monoheterocycles and oxygen-derived heterocycle could participate in the aryylation process. To our delight, uh, Electron-rich arenes such as trimethoxybenzene could also be aryylated using this condition. Finally, we wanted to do uh, late-stage uh, aryylation. So for that, what we did, we picked up a representative uh, pharmaceuticals which are embedded with arene moiety. We converted those to the corresponding non-symmetrical iodonium salt and then subjected them under optimized condition to perform the aryylation. And to our delight, what we learned that Pharmaceuticals such as gambifrozil, which is a triglyceride lowering drug, and as well as n methyl nemesolide, which is a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug, could be CH functionalized with a densely functionalized azuracil.
motif which demonstrate that these reactions are highly functional group tolerant and can easily be applied on functionally enriched substrates. With this, I'll talk to you briefly about the last story, which is about not C alkylation, but N alkylation of azeuracil using aryl diazoesters. So, like CH, C alkylation, N alkylation, N alkylation is also important because several docking studies have showed that N alkylation played a crucial role because this is the part which goes inside the pocket and hence modulation of this part plays an important role in the development of novel drug molecules. So simple methods one can use for the alkylation such as substitution reaction which is promoted by base and as well as one method we developed which works under base catalyzed base promoted process using triethylamine. So the first one gives primary alkyl, the second one gives secondary alkyl group but both of these process primarily works under strong basic conditions. So can we have a method which can be used under non-basic condition and kind of provides approach to both primary and secondary? So we ask ourselves that can we react azeuracil with diazo, uh, with diazo compound which can form carbene under photo-induced condition and then this azeuracil can undergo NH insertion process. And indeed, such a process could be realized under photo-induced condition in dichloromethane where the reaction proceeded to the formation of singlet carbene. Interestingly, when we carried out the reaction in 1,4-dioxane, the reaction took a heat out where this carbene was first intercepted with the corresponding uh, solvent, which is dioxane in this case, and then the azeuracil can bite back to open the ring and to give the corresponding compound. Nevertheless, the reaction demonstrated quite a good scope and we could prepare several molecules with such kind of thing. To give you a glimpse of the scope of the process, uh, aryl diazoacetates derived from gembifrozil, Cholesterols could be attached on the azeuracil through this simple prime alkylation process, which is a two-component process. We could also perform multi-component process using dioxane and several other solvents also, such as THF, to perform the corresponding multi-component annulation reaction. So, finally, having all of these tools in hand, we wanted to see that can we perform chronological site-selective process on azeuridines. So, for that, we took this representative azeuridine compound and first, we reacted it with aryl diazoacetates derived from cholesterol to force the first linkage between azeuridine and cholesterol. Then we wanted to see now on this molecule can we perform site selective CSP2 aryylation or alkylation. So for that we reacted this molecule with CH aryylation to see uh, derived from gembifrozil to append the corresponding CSP2 CSP2 linkage. And then finally we performed the CSP2H alkylation. In this case, what we did, we used NHPI ester derived from gembifrozil to perform the corresponding product. So I hope you have seen that how we can rapidly increase the molecular complexity to prepare molecules which kind of looks fascinating. So I hope in the last 15-20 minutes I was able to show you that how we can perform site selective CSP2H alkylation, arylation and N primary alkylation and secondary alkylation with the chemical tools we have developed in our laboratory. So uh, finally, I would like to thank my group. Uh, some of the co-workers are here. They presented their poster. And uh, project staff member, MSc students, and definitely SCRB and CSIR and IIT Jodhpur for the financial support. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Muralka, for sticking with the time. So at least, again, we can have two to three questions. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. What are your plans to use this modified nuclear basis and the nucleosides? Yeah, so as of now, what we have thought that uh, kind of uh, the collaborations we have established where we look into the anti-cancer activity. So we have done with our previous set of compounds and initial studies now we have a, based on the different site of modification, we have around compound library of 100 and 120 compounds. So we are looking into this anti-cancer activity of this class of compound, specifically in the centrosome biology where uh, kind of, uh, so in the previous case what we have seen that they are operating like a microtubule stabilizing drug. So as of now we are going to look into that and the cell lines what we use is HeLa cell line and, and uh, lung cancer cell line. So this is the primary set where we will start with and then we will see how things unfold. A quick follow up question if I may. Uh, have you tried the selective functionalization or a small oligo? Uh, as of now not but we are doing it on a separate project and in, I can tell you that we have a uh, very exciting results. So one of my PhD students is here. We are using we are using synergistic catalysis, and hopefully we will be able to do that, execute that project by summer this year. In water. 
Yes, yes. 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 that is the next challenge to take up. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Shah. So now we have a token of appreciation for the chairpersons. So we can't. You just, you just uh, huh, minimize so it. Finish the Mendes presentation first, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it will be later. Now. Yes. Right. And during Mendes presentation, can we? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, have the. No, we don't need. We don't need that. We don't need that. But only give you the this light. You know, become uh, too bright in the background when they take the picture. So can the projector be switched off? Switch off. No, maybe down. Downstairs is better. It'll be better. No, no, everything will be doing there only. Downstairs. Not here. Downstairs. Let's do that. No, we do Ma'am? Okay. 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 Few minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, we are going to start the poster award and presentation in a minute or two. Uh, let me briefly uh, describe to you the process through which uh, the posters were selected. There will be twenty-one. Uh, best poster awards as was announced earlier. But it turns out that both the committees felt that there were so many good posters that, in fact, if we had a chance, we would have given an award to each poster presenter. All the posters were really good. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. I mean, 299 posters were selected. I think there were about 20 dropouts, possibly. But uh, all the posters were really excellent. I went through as many as possible yesterday. On the first day, I missed because of the council meeting. So um, there will be 21 poster awards, one uh, by the Assam Science Society, 10 by RSC, 10 by uh, ACS. But then both the poster committees suggested to me that there were so many good posters that at least a few more which were, who were in the borderline uh, should find honorable mention. And we agreed to that. So five each from the two days have been selected 
to receive a certificate. Uh, so that is taking a bit of time for us to prepare, but give us a minute or two, we will start the program soon. So we will start with the RSC awards first. Are we ready? Okay, so uh, we will announce the 10 names first, okay? And uh, by the time the names are announced, please line up here. So we'll uh, give the certificates one by one and then photos will be taken and then a photo with all 10 of you because RSC would like to have, and also ACS would like to see the, all the poster awardees together. All right? Is that okay? Exactly, that's what I'm saying. So shall we go ahead? Are we ready? Okay. So go ahead and announce the uh, Yeah, you can. You can go ahead. I'll, I'll announce it. So uh, th thank you, Professor Mehta. Um, so the first set of winners from the poster presentation, but before that, let me thank all the other uh, co-chairpersons uh, who coordinated the entire uh, evaluation activity, no, along with all the experts. Um, as Professor Maitra mentioned, I think it was a good problem to have. Most of the posters were all of this very high quality, and, uh, and uh, the selection was not easy, as I said. So we will start with the Royal Society of Chemistry uh, po uh, poster winners. The first one is uh, P157, Pooja Kumari Jath from University of Rajasthan. The second winner is P175 poster Priya Sahani from IIT Jammu. But, but you want to give? No, I think we can give because. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, otherwise, it will be a lot of all posters right. in confusion. Okay, all right. So, so please Pooja Kumari, can you please? please, please. From University of Rajasthan. Priya Sahani. Ruchi Sharma, IIT Delhi. Poster number 195. Ruchi Sharma. Yeah. Ruchi Sharma from IIT Delhi. P202, Sanchita Ghosh, BARC Mumbai. P212, Parmar SV from Ashoka University. You can do the certificate in their hand, they will go take the certificate. Yeah. Priya Your Sanchita Parmar SP from Ashoka. Not there? Okay. I need the folder also. Maybe somebody from Ashoka can no, come and can pick I, up. You can come forward. From, ah, I'll request Dr. Vidya to maybe collect it. Yes. Ah. Okay, Parmar, come. You're right on time. Uh, from Ashoka University, P212. P05, Abhijit Saha from IIT Kanpur. P38, Asta M. Dvivedi from MSU Baroda. P62, Delna Johnson from IIT Gandhinagar. P64, Dhananjay S. Nipate, Bits Pilani, Pilani. Dhananjay? Is he around? Okay, then uh, we can proceed to P68, Divyansh Dhiman, IIT Rurki. Divyansh Nipati from IIT Rurki. <laughs> Sir, we'll, ju we'll just wait for Dhananjay and take the photograph with you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Has he come? Dhananjay, come first. <coughs> so, you can go ahead. Okay. All of you, please go for a photograph. Yes. 
So next we move on to the uh, poster awards. Okay. Okay. Also a special poster award instituted in the name of Professor R.K. Barua Memorial Best Poster Prize. This goes to Sumit Gangopadhyay, IIT Kharagpur. Sumit, right? Sumit. So, so, Sumit, you will also get a chance to be part of a group photo. Okay. Um, as Professor Maitra has mentioned, the President, uh, CRSI, in view of the very good performance in the posters and also the very high quality, it has been decided to uh, uh, give an honor, as an honorable mention, also give post uh, um, certificates to 10 poster uh, participants. The first one is P146 from Nikita Bhutani from IIT Mandi. <laughs> Nikita Bhutani, anybody from IIT Mandi? Or? Okay, nobody else. Okay, so P297, Zahid Ahmed Khan, IIT Kanpur. P31, Anubasita Parik Bitspilani. Okay. Okay. You are Anubasita, right? Okay. P28, Anu Agarwal, again from Bitspilani. P39, Asta Gupta, again from Bitspilani. Anu Agarwal. Who is Anu Agarwal? Anu Agarwal. You are Anu Agarwal. Asa, please. Asa, please take it. Anu Agarwal. Bits Pilani. You are Anu, you are Anu Agarwal. Okay. Uh, Anu Agarwal. And uh, P136, Narendra Dinkar Kharat. Bits Pilani. P81, Harsha, IIT Delhi. P286, Vishaka Jaiswal, Jaswal, Bits Pilani. Vishaka Jaiswal. P137, Narsima Varma, Bits Pilani. And last, P12, uh, Alka Khan from IIT Kanpur. Nasima Bhav. Okay. Now we come to the another exciting set of awards. We have uh, two young scientist awards. One is for Dr. Madhusri Sarkar of Bitspilani. Yeah. 
Dr. Nikita Grover from Bitspilani. Now we have the most interesting and exciting award. This award is for a school teacher uh, for best teacher uh, performance uh, from a Birla Public School, Dr. Rupa Mitra. Okay, so this is so special. Thank you, thank you, CRSI and Department of Chemistry, Bits Pilani, especially uh, Anilji and Indresh, so for like uh, accepting my uh, proposal of bringing the students from secondary as well as uh, sec uh, senior secondary school to attend a conference. So this gives them a kind of a exposure about the like dignified and versatile field of science. And also, I like to thank. Uh, Professor Jill Reed, they are not here right now, and uh, Dr. Alejandro Palermo, they uh, like accepted the invitation and they visited the school, Billa Public School Pilani, and they gave us a short talk there, and then personally like, interacted with the students. So yeah, thank you so much. This is really nice. Feel special. Thank you. Uh, we would definitely come back here and have an educational program for the school children from this region. We'll try to do that. We thank Professor Maitra for handing over all the certificates. My job. OK, so uh, we move forward to the presentation uh, by the organizers of CRSI NSC 33, Dr. Rakesh Bandichor and uh, Dr. Osrinivas. Students, poster session, poster awards are over, but you are still requested to stay till the end. Okay, don't run away. Lunch is not ready anyway. Start 12 o'clock. I don't know what to say. Good morning or good afternoon. So thank you so much for um, giving us opportunity to host upcoming CRSI conference. So this is going to be the first CRSI uh, conference to be hosted by industry partners. So um, you can see the convener and co-convener uh, from you know two different sites from. Uh, two different sites having same uh, parent organization. So uh, moving forward uh, in, in, the, in, the, in this presentation, I want to highlight about this RSI and uh, about the upcoming event and site and you know how to reach, all kind of things we'll discuss here. So if you look at you know the establishment of CRSI is 1999, right? And as a part of the 50th, anniversary celebration of the country's independence. So considering that, 
So, upcoming event is going to be Silver Jubilee. So, we are excited to host, uh, you know, Silver Jubilee uh, celebration of KRSI at Dr. Reddy's. So, we will be partnering with ACS and of course, KRSI, Dr. Reddy's and ACS, these three bodies will take part uh, in such a way that we can create a benchmark. And Dr. Reddy's is in Hyderabad and uh, the date is going to be 4th to 7th of July 2024. And how to reach? If you, if you come from airport to Dr. Reddy's, it's going to be 46 kilometers, 56 minutes. And if you want to come from, uh, air, uh, from railway station, it's going to be 23 kilometers and 47 minutes. So the city is quite well connected from different, different parts of the uh, uh, states, cities, and, and, and across the world. Um, when you commute, I think, you know, there is plenty of connectivity by bus, cars, whatever you want to take services in the city, right from airport or railway station um, throughout. So look at the site. This is the event site. We have got leadership academy. So there is a big hall that can keep around 280 people. And there is a uh, satellite rooms. Uh, there are two satellite rooms that can host around 80, 80 people. There are, there are two more room, uh, rooms that has 60, 60 people uh, can be hosted there. We have got canteen. We have got beautiful scenic view that you can see from our site. And next to this, there is a, uh, a big R&D center. We call it IPDO. So we will have privilege to walk through the R&D center and see how we work and, you know, uh, what kind of setup we have. So accommodation shortlisted here, there is a leadership academy, there are 30 rooms. So we can uh, host some of the people there. And we, we have uh, initial discussion with ILA Hotel, Avasa Hotel. Avasa Hotel is uh, Dr. Reddy's family hotel and Nobatel. So depending on the number of people that we get registered and, you know, whoever is coming, we will keep them accordingly. So coming to the uh, uh, budget part, we we are trying to arrange money close to 50 lakhs so that you know we can we can have wonderful event. So if you look at the breakup, uh, 50 lakhs of, uh, rupees already approved by Dr. Reddy's. We are ex expecting close to five lakhs from KRSI through registration and other funding, and five lakhs we are looking at funding uh, from funding agencies like CSI, RDSC, and all, and. Uh, Five lakhs, I think Dr. Sinwas has uh, taken responsibility to help us, and 10 lakhs from various industries. So the goal is 50 lakhs, let's see how much we get. And uh, we considered around 200 people um, on behalf of KRSI, considering all the stakeholders plus council members and the, the registrants. And there will be 150 people plus from academia, and we don't expect more than 50 uh, people from industry because a lot of people are engaged in their day-to-day -day work and it's a, uh, industries are business owners. I'm, I don't expect more number of people coming from industry. And uh, looking at all these numbers, we, in, we anticipate uh, there, there won't be more than 400, but having Silver Jubilee event, I think, you know, we can expect more than that and we are prepared to uh, accommodate close to So breakup is here, 280 people from uh, in uh, auditorium, 80 people in CCP, there is a room name, and 80 people Volga, 60 people Thames, and 60 people Ganga, there is a room name. So this is your convener, and this is your co-convener, and if you want to have some discussion, we can meet. So I think Sinwas can put some thoughts or words and in order to have great so event. I, I, I think uh, I, I don't have much to add here except that uh, it's a very big festival that we look forward, 25th anniversary of uh, CRSI. And as Rakesh mentioned, uh, doing it in industry premises also sends a context because chemistry and industry are closely interconnected. So I think it's a good opportunity for us to be able to plan. 
So we look forward to welcoming you again in uh, July in, uh, in Hyderabad and uh, also working closely with uh, Professor Maitra and past presidents, Professor Vinod Singh and Professor Jairaman to make sure that this 25th uh, anniversary of CRSI certainly will be a benchmark and also will be something really memorable, uh, both for CRSI and for Hyderabad. So we look forward to welcoming you. I think just maybe a matter of five months from now. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, I'll re now I'll request uh, the professors of my chemistry department, Professor Neil Kumar, Professor Dilip Kumar, and Professor Indesh Kumar to present the memento. Now I'll request Professor Indesh Kumar to address <clears throat> Dear participants, a very good afternoon to all of you. Finally, the show has come to an end and we are here to conclude this great event CRSI NSC 32 at Bits Pilani Pilani campus. CRSI NSC 32 was an endeavor to provide a common platform for researchers to share their scientific results on sustainable development in chemical science. <clears throat> on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, I would like to thank each one of you for joining this event and making it a grand success. I also want to specially thank Professor Uday Mitra, President CRSI, Professor V.K. Singh, immediate past president CRSI, Professor N. Jairaman, and other CRSI authorities for believing in us and giving us this opportunity to host such a nice, uh, to host such a nice audience. Dear participants, with the resources available, our team has tried their level best to make your stay most comfortable. Still, if there were any shortcomings, I sincerely offer my apology and look forward to critical comments to improve further. I congratulate all the poster award winners. Indeed, it's a matter of quite satisfaction and a great happiness to see that the number of award winners and consolation prizes to our department students. Hats off to them. I believe that the message is all set, that the Department of Chemistry is ready to go higher and higher in research profile at the national level by having such a quality students. Uh, later, the vote of thanks will be separately given by Professor Anil Kumar. Uh, before that, I thank you once again for joining us here at Bits Pilani campus. As rightly said, there is no goodbye. So I hope to see you all soon. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now I'll request Professor Uday Metra for concluding remarks. Uh, good afternoon. I really don't have much to add to what has already been discussed. Uh, except that I would like to thank all of you for uh, staying till the end of this NSC 32. Uh, and again, once again, I would like to congratulate all the poster participants. Uh, although we could give 31 uh, poster certificates, but every single poster, I, I would like to repeat, was really good. And I thank all of you for taking the time to prepare nice posters, nice prints, and explaining uh, enthusiastically to the visitors. Thank you very much. Uh, we really had you know, three, three, and a four, three and a half days of excellent talks and other events. Uh, a formal thank you will be presented by uh, Secretary, but uh, I would like to thank the chemistry department, everyone in the chemistry department in the administration for doing a great job in hosting us, and we really had great time, uh, good accommodation, reasonably good weather, and uh, including a thunderstorm, surprise thunderstorm this morning, uh, and excellent food. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now I'll request CRSI Secretary, Professor Nilima Gupta, for a vote of thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, so, President CRSI Professor Uday Matra, uh, all other past president uh, CRSI, uh, Professor Chandrasekharan, Professor Vinod Singh, Professor Saurapal, uh, Professor Braunschweig, Professor Goodwin, present here. Organizers of the 32, uh, 32nd CRSI NSC, the three Kumars, uh, other honorable distinguished guests, all medalists, speakers, invited speakers, and dear uh, participating delegates. So having been called upon to propose a formal, formal vote of thanks on behalf of the CRSI, so I must express our sincere thanks to Professor V. Ram Gopal Rao, Vice Chancellor Bits Pilani, for all necessary administrative support and sanctions to the organizers of the excellently organized 32nd NSE and 17th CRSI RSC Symposia. Very special acknowledgement uh, to the unstinted support and pleasantly witnessed exemplary presence of the director, Professor Sudhir Kumar Barai, uh, who uh, very generously interacted with all the delegates. And many of us will have long lasting memories, uh, so many anecdotes shared by him with us. I must acknowledge the uh, support from other deans, admins, and senior officials at BITS Pilani for making this conference a grand success. Thanks are due to the Royal Society of Chemistry for their continuing cooperation, active participation, and generous support in organizing the CRSI RSC Joint Symposium series and arranging the excellent speakers. Special thanks uh, are to, due to Leandro Palremo and Professor Jill Reed, uh, President RSC, for traveling to India for this meeting. Presence of other academic and industry partners in the symposium is also very gratefully acknowledged. CRSI acknowledges the generous financial support from the sponsors, including SCRB, CSIR, CAS, ACS, GEOL, Syngenta, Dr. Reddy's, and so many other industry partners, the long list is displayed here on the right side, uh, that makes uh, eventually a conference a great uh, success and a great help to the organizers. Special thanks are also due to the RSC and ACS for the sponsorship of the poster awards to the young participants. Uh, we are thankful to all our esteemed invited speakers, awardees, and session chairs for taking time out of their busy schedule to be here. I also, thank the, I also take this opportunity to thank all our senior CRSI mentors, 
past presidents, present and former council members, conveners and co-conveners of the local and regional chapters, I mean, and guests from various other organizations, and all other distinguished delegates. I must not forget to mention our young PhD and postdoc students. Uh, eventually, uh, they make the conference and ECRSI symposium a grand success. So a good number of young delegates was seen here traveling from far and wide, uh, you know, from all over the country. So thanks to them for making this uh, event, four days event, a grand success. The smooth conduct of an event of such a magnitude is not possible without the team spirit and untiring devotion of time and energy by the faculty members, student volunteers, and the support staff. CRSI places on record their dedicated contribution of the, uh, you know, various, uh, we know, teams and committees for travel, food, accommodation, registration, technical session, poster presentation, so various teams working under the guidance of Professor Dalip Kumar, Professor Anil Kumar, Professor Indresh Kumar. Sumptuous food from We Fast Kitchen uh, during the conference deserves special mention. As we heard from the delegates, uh, they enjoyed it a lot. On behalf of uh, the CRSI Council, I take the opportunity to congratulate enormously the organizers, the whole organizing team, for an excellently organized event. Chilling cold weather of Pilani was, you know, uh, very comfortably warmed up with the warm ho hospitality extended by three Kumars and their dedicated team. Untiring team of their young and energetic volunteers, student volunteers, deserve special appreciation. On behalf uh, of all of us, yeah, so let us give them a big round of applause for excellent arrangements, wonderful hospitality, and be available always, everywhere, to support all the delegates, as and when required. We hope that the symposium has successfully fulfilled its objectives in bringing together eminent experts, emerging and established chemists, industry personnel, and young researchers from all over the country and abroad also, uh, and providing ample opportunity to everyone uh, to exchange their views and ideas. I hope everyone goes uh, back uh, with some additions to uh, their, uh, you know, uh, academic things. Last but not the least, thanks to all those involved directly or indirectly in making this conference a grand success. On behalf of CRSI, we look forward to see you in Hyderabad in July. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Now I'll request Professor Dilip Kumar and Professor Anil Kumar for thanks. Very good afternoon. So as we came together in Raurkela, <clears throat> same way we are standing here. Thank you so much. And we don't have much words to express. It's, it's a so great pleasure. Whole as a team, all of you together, we worked. And uh, I'm sure all of you have enjoyed in terms of scientific gain, collaboration, interactions. And uh, <clears throat> we, we would like to thank uh, BIT, BIT's administration the support we received, you know, starting from our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ram Gopal Rao, and our di Director, Bits Pilani Pilani Campus, Professor Sudhir Kumar Barai, Dean Administration, all officers, technical, non-technicals, and you could have seen that in auditorium, how the people were working. And superb support from the student volunteer. They have done big job for this conference. Thank you so much, students. And, you know, <clears throat> without support from uh, financial sport, it's hard to conduct such activities. And, uh, you know, the sponsorship, you can see the huge list uh, sport we received, particularly to mention uh, DST Serb, CSIR New Delhi, 
Syngenta, Reddy's Lab, ACS, Royal Society, and many more, you know, the sponsors, GEOL including. So big sport, thank you so much for this financial support. And uh, we wish that this activity could have continued, but you know, the time always uh, give and allow the window for the next one. So we look forward to the next uh, meeting and the closer interaction and working with all of you. Thank you so much. And then, uh, first, I would like to thank the CRSI President Professor Uday Metra, uh, uh, past presidents, especially Professor Sorapal, Professor Chandrasekharan, Professor Satyamurthy Sir, Professor V K Singh. Uh, your guidance and support helped us to uh, do whatever best we could do in last three and a half day, and uh, especially our administration staff. Uh, Professor Ram Gopal Rao, Vice Chancellor Bitspilani, and more, very special thanks to Director Professor Sudhir Kumar Barai. He was there till last 11 o'clock, like every night. He was there with us in good celebration and in our difficult times also. He was standing behind us. So very special thank to Professor Sudhir Kumar Barai, uh, Director Bitspilani Pilani Campus. Uh, our all administration staff, special thanks to all the participants. Uh, whenever I have asked them, maybe go into the hall or shouted them or said I'm not able to do it, they all helped me, they listened to me. Very special thanks to all the participants. You have come from so fast distances, in the weather was not conducive, but still you have, the attendance was very much uh, there in participation. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. A big thank you to all. Lunch. Sorry. So the lunch will be in the we fast cafeteria, no, institute cafeteria. Some uh, those who are leaving quickly, the we fast is also available for faculty colleagues. They can go to we fast uh, while checking out. They can have a lunch, and in we institute cafeteria it is available. Thank you so much again. Let's. All the bits faculty and students, they can stay for a photograph. <laughs>